like a poison. September is going, going. I will be your remedy, bring you up and help you see. Hold you close, then set you free. Promise what I cannot keep buried deep is a quiet sea. Winter comes and all the small creatures sleep. the water calling moon here and there but leaving soon lonely and pining for you love you're a fickle wolf go home you drunk you wandering fool I will be your farmer Keep you well when day's young Light your life just like the sun Steal your breath when day is done Love Like a poison September Is going, going Lying at your feet Well, your prayers will be heard The moment you start to believe it Just before you begin Because it's easy To lose yourself in a war Cherish every single day. Fortune, 
I don't write cause I don't think I don't have a need to speak I don't see the bright side quite as clear Accolades and happy days They don't ever last Stories of courage Clouded up with fear In the broom grass I would lie Glimmer in my eye The sun smiled back on me From victory I tried Match eternal life Now I live my life Of course I was forced to retreat From victory I accept Waxy green and yellow walk Outside my windows fall Covering the light I thought I'd see Am I sad or am I sick? What's at the root of it? Do I throw my hands and quit? Something tells me no in the broom grass I would lie Glimmer in my eye Sun smiled back on me From victory I tried Match eternal life How I live my life Of course I was forced to retreat from victory, I accept defeat. Worries on all sides of my mind. In silence, my darkness is denied. I would lie Glimmer in my eye The sun smiled back on me From victory I tried To match eternal life How I lived my life Of course I was forced to retreat 
from victory I set to me from victory I set just escape. Hi, good morning, everyone. And we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so by way of brief introduction, my name is Frank Lynn. I direct the Cochlear Center for Hearing and Public Health. I know many of you in the room. Um, I first want to thank all of you for coming. Um, you know, the first time we did this was over three years ago when we first started the center. We had over 80 people come, and it was this phenomenal event where it allowed for a degree of collaboration with other universities, other researchers, which was really hard to mimic any other way. We obviously didn't do this the last couple of years uh, for obvious reasons. And this year, uh, I want to thank all of you coming because we just literally, literally announced about a month ago because we weren't even sure whether or not we could do it in person. Um, so I want to thank all of you for coming. And then uh, I know, thank everyone who's joining us virtually as well, who couldn't make it in person. But thank you for, for coming us and uh, learning about uh, what we're doing at the Cochlear Center and how to potentially collaborate going forward. So, in terms of some very brief remarks, though, I'm going to first mention that um, the way this day is structured is that there are uh, a series of three talks this morning, uh, me followed by Jennifer Deal and SRO, we'll then have a 15 minute break, and then three other talks by our other uh, 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 core faculty, then there'll be a 15 minute break, and then we're going to transition uh, from there at that point uh, to Natalie Phillips, we're thrilled for joining us, it's our first outside speaker, and I think over two years is joining us. Um, but for the keynote talk, we're actually going to move across to the other side of the second floor um, where the keynote talk will be held, and then we'll come back here from 1 to 3 p.m. where there'll be um, a poster session and then lunch. And it allows, allows us, if you're wondering why we're moving, it allows um, time to break down uh, the room. Um, so I'm going to begin sort of the welcoming remarks and then um, so the niches we're doing at the center uh, with a slide like this. So uh, the prevalence of hearing loss. So as Probably many of you realize uh, there are about roughly 38 million Americans uh, with hearing loss. But more importantly, this is, uh, you know, this is obviously US specific, but if you look at the prevalence values, it becomes very, very clear. This is, these are prevalence values, which likely apply to almost any other country in the world. But you see the prevalence of a hearing loss basically almost doubling with every age decade, right? Going from 13% in the 50s, then to 26, 54%, et cetera. So this is a condition obviously that affects uh, the majority of ad older adults by far. So with that, notion in mind of how common hearing loss is, um, there are a few foundational principles of why the Cochlear Center is even around as a center. And the first one is really, I think, our inherent belief for everyone who works at the center is that our fundamental belief uh, deep down is that we believe our ability to hear and engage with others and everyone around us is foundational for healthy aging. So despite hearing loss being so common, despite hearing loss being, being a natural process of aging, we do believe it's actually fundamentally important. And we think a lot of times that's not acknowledged. So we believe with that core belief. Uh, from there then, we go then to this general belief that the widespread prevalence of hearing loss, it's not going away. Uh, despite better prevention now, actually the absolute risk of hearing loss is lower nowadays than it was 30 years ago for age cohorts. Um, and possibly, you know, future neurostortive therapies. I can assure you, I think probably many people agree, the prevalence, widespread prevalence is not going away. Maybe it's the fundamental issues of biological aging hearing loss is always going to be there to a large degree. So from that perspective, then the other core principle of the center then is what we're focusing on really is what can be done now to address hearing loss at scale through what we say are transformative public health strategies. And now, not looking at pie in the sky therapies, not looking at pie in the sky strategies, but
but what can be done now in our lifetimes, next five to 10 years, to really impact the widespread prevalence of hearing loss in older adults? What can be done now? And from there, then, the, the last I mentioned is finally the mission of the center, then, is to train individuals from the US and around the world to begin to approach hearing loss with this public health mindset. I think a lot of times in the auditory space, maybe realize it comes more from a psychology or also a neuroscience paradigm where you don't necessarily think at scale. I think that's, that's part one progress. Um, from there, though, I'm not going to talk about this more, though, but Jennifer Deal, who is our Associate Director of Academic Training, she'll be going much more into some of the, some of the training programs we do at the center, some of our initiatives uh, in terms of specific training. Just top left, I want to photo from this past year, uh, the previous year, and then this is a few years ago when we, we did the East Asian Fellows Program, we had 35 people from uh, East Asia join us at Hopkins for a week to learn about these public health programs. But again, uh, Dr. Deal will talk to us much more in, in her talk. Uh, so what I wanted to do was actually talk a little more about um, some of the major initiatives that we're doing at the Cochlear Center. So when we say transformative public health strategies, what we're talking about fundamentally is we work across five different areas, basically the population of evidence, which is the foundation for everything we do. Uh, from there, then public awareness, different types of care models for how we address hearing loss, healthcare policy and hearing technology. I'm not going to cover all of this today, but what I want to focus on today in particular are sort of uh, three key initiatives across three of these areas um, that we've been implementing over the past year and which we're going to carry us forth into the next year, which um, I think may be of interest. So from the first sort of major initiative for the next year in terms of public health evidence is uh, one of the big things is our completion of the ACHIEVE trial, the ACHIEVE randomized control trial and dissemination of these results. And what this trial, for many of you might know about already, it's predicated on this notion uh, over the last 10 years, where I understand that hearing loss um, appears to be very strongly linked with cognitive impairment and dementia through actually mechanisms that may in fact be modifiable. And this brings up then fundamentally the idea of hearing loss as being potentially a potentially modifiable late life risk factor for cognitive decline and dementia. And that's, that's important. I mean, some groups, the Lancet Commission, uh, some of you may have heard of, have estimated that hearing loss may in fact be the dominant risk factor, given how prevalent it is in older adults and the risk ratio between hearing loss and dementia. But it's potentially modifiable, is it in fact? And that's exactly what the ACHIEVE trial is getting at. In a large scale randomized control trial, randomizing a cohort of older adults to basically either getting hearing loss intervention or successful aging control intervention, so basically controlling for exposure study personnel, isolating in fact whether if you address hearing loss, can we in fact reduce the risk of cognitive decline and dementia over time. So this trial has been in, a, in planning for a long stage and execution, so it's been 10 years in coming. So a lot of the founders of epidemiologic studies were begun over 10 years ago, 2011 when I first joined the faculty here, is when these initial studies were coming out. Then from there, it took two years just to plan the trial. Two years of a funded grant just to literally plan, design the trial, not even do it yet. Then 2017, the final trial was funded for the CHIEF trial, which is a large investment from the NIH and, and a trial of this magnitude. From 2018 to 2019, two years of recruitment to get to a sample size of about 1,000 people. There's then been, everyone's been followed for three years. So the last follow-up point will be the end of this year which means in the final achieved randomized trial results will be available early next year. So 10 years in planning, and over the next year, we're gonna see the final results of this trial, which will tell us in a large scale RCT, does in fact treating hearing loss in older adults compared to just an attention control intervention, um, does in fact reduce someone's risk, cognitive decline, dementia, and brain aging. So these results are coming in the next year. Um, just a huge word of thanks in particular to the achieved trial is obviously led by a team of people here at Hopkins, but also from around the country. So this. It was a kickoff meeting in 2017 that represents about a third of the people involved. So it's a huge, huge undertaking that's literally wrapping up in the next year. Now, obviously, because of this, the trial's ongoing. I have no results to share with you. I can't even you know, see results myself. But one thing I'm always really proud of, I always have to show the chief trial and hopefully anticipation of the results is, um, is some of the, the compliance and visits to date. So on the left there, that represents recruitment. So the blue line would be if we had evenly recruited uh, 850 people over 18 months, which is what we projected initially. And then the black line is actually what we did in terms of recruitment. So as many of you know, the death knell for any clinical trial is always recruitment. But we were actually just two weeks behind uh, because of how well recruitment was going. We kept open a few months longer with permission from the NIA, the National Institute on Aging. And we ultimately hit a sample size of 977. The reason we're authorizing to go a little longer was because we're on a very upswing of recruitment at that point. And we all realized that a trial of this magnitude would likely never be repeated again, not in the United States, and maybe, maybe not in other parts of the world. So you expand the sample size, it gives you more definitive results, whether it's positive or negative, hopefully positive, of course, but either way, you get a more definitive result if you have a larger sample size. Since then, the compliance with the study visits uh, across such all time frames 
uh, has been phenomenally good. Um, the 30 month and 30 month are still ongoing right now, which is why the expected numbers are a little lower. Uh, but again, the last visit will be at the very end of this year, and then we'll trial results uh, next year for this trial. All right, so that's one major initiative. This sort of literally 10 years in planning, definitive randomized control trial, does treating hearing loss actually in fact delay dementia? We'll have a better idea in the next, in essentially the next year. Um, the next initiative I want to talk to you guys about that um, that we're beginning this year in earnest is a, a public awareness campaign uh, where it's basically what we call the launch of the Know Your Hearing Number campaign. So, what is that? So, this is all predicated on the fact that, probably for many of you, realize, uh, irrespective of whether you have these conditions or not, that for a lot of chronic health conditions of older adults, is that there are known health metrics that even as a lay consumer that you may be aware of. So blood pressure, a lot of people know roughly, you know, 120 or 80 is not bad, higher numbers are worse. Um, if you have diabetes or your friends have, or your parents have diabetes, you might be aware of what your blood glucose value is. And people, if you're diabetic, I guarantee you probably know what your blood glucose value is, you're monitoring it. Likewise, on the bottom left, um, uh, probably many of you at some point, if you have any of you wear glasses or wear contact lenses, you might have a rough idea of what your diopter, your, your visual acuity is. So, negative 3.75, negative 4, it's actually not bad. I'm like negative 12. I'm terrible, actually, right? But those numbers for a lot of you wear glasses, that might mean something like, oh, wow, your vision is really bad, Frank, right? So, these numbers in the end, these health metrics, which are really commonly used, often, more often than not, when they become useful, they have four different principles. One is that these numbers are universal. You could get your blood glucose here or in India or China, it's going to be the same value. It doesn't matter. At the same time, these numbers are accessible. You can actually have a home blood glucose monitor. You can have your home blood pressure monitor. You get these values, you can monitor something. They're infinitely accessible. These numbers are actionable, right? If you see your blood pressure is a little high, you may be like, ugh, I probably need to back off eating so much salt. Or if your blood glucose value came high, you may be like, I, I need to you know, watch the diet. If, you're, if you notice that your refraction may worse, you might need new glasses, for instance, right? And finally, these numbers are clinically meaningful. We know if you have a high blood glucose, a high blood pressure, it's tied to clinical outcomes that we all care about. That's what makes these metrics very, very useful. In contrast, as probably many of you realize for hearing, we have the audiogram. For any of you who've had a hearing test, you may get a copy of this report, and then you might hear something to the fact that, oh yes, you have a mild to a moderate hearing loss progressing to a severe hearing loss of high frequencies, and no one knows what that means. I mean, the clinicians, you guys know what that means, but for anyone else, I assure you that they don't. They don't take away anything from this. People have shown this in research-wise, that no, nothing sticks when you give something like this. So the question is, why do we not have a common health metric for hearing? And the amazing thing is we actually could, right? So already now, there, a hearing number very much is summarized. The way we a lot of times we summarize audio from a research point of view is we take the average of four frequencies, 500 or 4,000, which are the main speech frequencies, and that number conveniently is between roughly zero and 100. And that number fundamentally represents how loud speech sounds have to be for you to hear them. And this PTA, the pure tone average, already serves the basis of existing classifications that we use from a research perspective. The class of someone is normal, mild, moderate, severe. They're based on these values, but we never give patients or clinicians, uh, never give patients or consumers values. Instead, we just say generally it's mild or moderate, mild or moderate, and we don't summarize it one value. Now, increasingly, I think there's a push and there's a thought that we need to. And the reason why is because the PTA, or what we colloquially call a hearing number for this, for this campaign purposes, is that it actually meets these criteria now. So the PTA, you realize, actually is universal. You can get your hearing measured here, or in India, or China, or Australia, you'll get the same PTA value all the time. In contrast, other hearing metrics that are based on speech, things like that, that changes from language to language, whether it's live presentation or recorded presentation, there's nothing universal about other metrics of hearing to be used. Now in Portland though, just in the last few years now, the PTA or the hearing number actually meets these other three criteria. A few years ago, they wouldn't have. And the reason why I say that is that number now, the PTA actually is now accessible. So five years ago, if you only, the only way to get your PTA was to go to an ENT or audio, like audiologist, that number is not accessible. That's a barrier to getting the number. But I'll tell you now, just in the last three years now, you can get this value. So this is, for those of you who tried, this is baked into every single iPhone now. You go to the health app and you can get a validated audiogram. So this is actually mine. So my PTA or my hearing number is a 12 in my left ear and a 10 in my right ear. So ultimately now, 
the PTA or the hearing number becomes accessible because of this technology platform, which wasn't available a few years ago. At the same time, I'll say this number now becomes actionable. If the only way to act on your PTA is you have to spend, um, you know, four thousand dollars on a pair of hearing aids, that number it does not become actionable for a consumer. But in fact, now it becomes actionable, right? So I'll talk about later over-the-counter hearing aids. As you become accessible, you can actually act on that number, whereas before you couldn't. Now I show Air, Apple Ear. Well, I'm show Apple AirPod Pro. So probably many of you realize in the last six months now, Apple AirPods have now released the conversational boost feature, which basically turns the AirPod Pro essentially into a hearing. People have tested as such, it amplifies and actually improves your signal noise ratio. And it's not that I'm a, you know, I'm a huge proponent of Apple products here, but I think what Apple does, everyone recognizes, and why I'm so excited about this, is Apple over the last 20 years has reshaped ecosystems and technology uptake more so than any company in the history of essentially the last 100 years. Right? Think about the Apple um, iPod, iPods, iPods and digital music, then the iPhone, the iPad, AirPods, Apple Watch. So Apple as a company has been able to lead in terms of uptake and influencing other technologies, right? More so than any other company out there. So when I see Apple now beginning to integrate essentially the hearing number, they don't call it as such yet, into their platforms, and they've already been baking into the AirPod Pros on the ability to make a hearing aid, that begins to get very exciting because it begins to change potentially behaviors, right? And for instance, for me, I'll say just a pure personal example here. My PTA is a 12 and 10, which is eh, not bad, right? And I was like, that's pretty good. But then I saw my son's, who's 14, his is a four. And I was like, ooh, my hearing actually has probably gotten worse since I was his age. So at recently, I actually I turned on the conversational boost feature on my AirPod Pros. Every time I put on that, it amplifies. And at first, it was completely distracting. But after a month of using it now, I actually sort of like it. So it changes behaviors that sell you for me now with essentially quote unquote normal hearing that I'm noticing the benefits and application in certain situations. And I can tell you five years from now, my PTA is a 20 or something like that. It changes how consumers begin to uptake technologies if they can monitor health metric that becomes action. The last thing I'll mention too in terms of clinical meaningfulness, right? So I'll say 10 years ago, the PTA may not be that clinically meaningful, but all the research that I showed you in the past about hearing and dementia and things like that, that research in the past in 10 years has been predicated on the PTA, right? So the PTA from that perspective is becoming clinically meaningful because it gives you a sense of risk ratio, not necessarily at the individual level, but risk at a population of what hearing means for other clinically meaningful outcomes. So it's really just in the last four years, these criteria have been met. Now, where we are with this campaign right now over the last year, partnering with a communications firm called Hager Sharp, is we've actually been, uh, since uh, last year through the summer of this year, we've been planning the launch of a consumer facing campaign and dissemination of the Know Your Hearing Number initiative in collaboration with select industry partners. So, Mimi, Jacody, Sonic Cloud, these are the three companies that actually offer a validated app on your phone right now that you can actually get your hearing number. So, strategically partner them early on to roll up this campaign, it'll be public facing that informs consumers on what the hearing number is, how to act on it, why it's clinically meaningful, and essentially what you can do about it and what it means for you. Right? So that's phase one, it's going the summer. Then beginning next year, we're planning to begin to plan phase two. This will be a larger campaign where a part of it will focus on more traditional urban media, dissemination of the Know Your Hearing Number campaign with collaboration with nonprofit apps and partners, things like the ARP, Hearing Association of America, things like that. But more importantly, beginning to think through establishment of industry consortium of uh, basically essentially OTC hearing companies and the like that will begin adopting use of the hearing number and all their consumer facing apps and technology. So it begins empowering consumers through the existing technology platform, what the hearing number means and how you can act with that sort of phase two. But the first phase of summer launching is just a consumer facing web campaign in partnership with select companies. All right, so that's sort of the, the one key initiative from the awareness point of view. The last thing I want to finish up now is one of our key uh, initiatives over the next year around healthcare policy, and it's specifically around informing Medicare legislation. So where is this coming from? So as probably many of you realize, this is, this is unique to the US, but actually probably very similar to many other countries in the world. There are two signature, signature pieces of historic federal policy that have dictated uh, the current shape of the US hearing care market. Uh, the first one is Medicare. In 1965, when Medicare was passed, specifically diagnostic hearing tests are covered, but anything around hearing aids or related treatment services are completely excluded from coverage from Medicare and hence most of their most of their insurance programs. That's one piece of legislation. The second one, 1977, the FDA uh, actually created special controls on hearing and medical devices, which basically limits their sales to only a state licensed hearing professional, usually an audiologist, ENT, or a hearing uh, technician. 
Now, these legislation made like this, this sort of theoretical like, wise this way. It didn't make sense back then. Medicare in 1965, hearing was not a priority, it was more acute care. FDA in 1977, only way hearing aids could be safe and effective in that, in that era was for them to be let, to get provided through a, a licensed professional. So these, these regulations made sense back then. But you care for us next to the, to the present day, 40 years later, and there, there are a few implications. One is that you, you very much now for hearing, you have a gatekeeper model. Only way someone can access a hearing aid, despite it being prevalent, hearing loss being prevalent, two thirds older adults, is you have to go through an ENT or an audiologist. So it's fine if it's a rare condition, not common condition. The condition affects two thirds older adults. That is a huge barrier to access for the gatekeeper model. At the same time, for a lot of audiology hearing aid dispensers, there's fundamentally an incentive to always sell a hearing aid. If you can't be reimbursed for your services, the only way to get reimbursed for your time is to sell a hearing aid. That changes how um, can professionals can interact with consumers if that's the case. And finally, it's a huge barrier to entry. Companies like you know, Apple tongue in cheek or Samsung or Bose, they can't enter the hearing aid market to create more innovative or more competitive hearing aids because if they did, they would not be able to sell directly to the consumer. They can only sell directly through a licensed professional. It's a much harder market to crack into. When it finally comes down to it, it's fundamentally hearing aids as a, just a basic stepping stone technology for, for hearing loss has fundamentally evolved into a very low, model, low volume, a high margin economic model of care, which does not serve the needs of the many. It serves the needs of the few, but not the many. So um, beginning years ago now, um, we, I would say we're halfway there in the States. And one big thing that happened several years ago in partnership with Congress and, and the National Academies and the White House back then uh, was passage of the Over-the-Counter Hearing Aid Act. And probably many are familiar with this. This is, was bipartisan legislation uh, that came out in response to reports in the White House and National Academies, which instructed the FDA to re-regulate hearing aids and permit OTC regulated hearing aids. These draft regulations were just released a few months ago, and they're going to be finalized later this year, which means by the end of this year, early next year, we'll have an evolving market of OTC hearing in the States that allows for companies like, again, theoretically Apple, Bose, Samsung to enter the hearing aid market directly. Implications of this, it hasn't even happened, happened yet, but many people are what's going to happen now that we have draft regulations and finalization is on, the, is on the horizon, is you're going to clearly see increased competition and consumer access to affordable OTC hearing, which is great, but there's some missing gaps, right? So people who can't figure out how to use OTC hearing, how to buy one, what to buy, those hearing care services are not covered by insurance. At the same time, people with greater than a moderate hearing loss, which wouldn't be served by OTC hearing aids, their hearing aids still aren't covered. So what do we do about that? So begin, begin several years, we recognize this gap in terms of where the US was headed. So we've been trying to inform Medicare legislation now for the last several years. And this began years ago, this was a, it's an op-ed drafted by, by Nick Reed and me and Amber Willing, published in JAMA, where we begin laying out the argument that ODC is coming, but we need also focus on, we need coverage for folks on clinical services, published in obviously JAMA, so more of a medical journal. From there, then, how we can segue the, the uh, dissemination, I would say, informing of policymakers is we began developing formal policy briefs. So, formal policy briefs from the center, these are white papers, these are the one page, meant to be very quickly digestible for policymakers. They're oftentimes requested by policymakers that we disseminate to congressional staff and, and other people in, in, um, in DC. Um, so, just very formal policy briefs coming directly from the center. From there then, it's targeting direct earned media through, uh, through essentially the, the widespread press. So Health Affairs blog is very influential among um, uh, policy staffers in general. Uh, and Marilyn Albert, who's a big dementia researcher, and I drafted a uh, op-ed around um, dementia policy as a national priority, that's be a classic clickbait. Uh, dementia policy is a national priority, that's why companies expand Medicare to cover hearing aids. Again, making the arguments for the coverage of services to augment OTC hearing aids. On the right there, uh, Charlotte Ye, who's the Chief Medical Officer at AARP, Christine Castle, formerly the head of PCAS, the White House President's Council of Technology. We draft an op-ed for Stat News around making hearing aids affordable is enough. Older adults also need hearing care. So it's basically uh, trying to get um, our, our beliefs out more in the public through uh, earned media, through, through these other channels that are outside the medical channel. And the most recent, the last year too, trying a new, new tack too, we actually push up uh, a comic book, uh, four pages, uh, working with Ian Sampson, who's incredibly talented, and creating a, pol a, a comic book, uh, which is also disseminated to members of Congress and other policymakers around another aspect of how we inform policymakers around our take on what's missing in the U.S. healthcare ecosystem, namely the coverage of Medicare services. So uh, we can't fully take credit for this, obviously, but we're, we're, we, we think hopefully it had a role at least. Uh, so many of you heard in July 2021, the White House announced the Build Back Better plan, a $1.75 trillion social spending bill, 
which actually included Medicare hearing coverage. So if you look on the right there, that is what how you allocate $1.75 trillion in federal spending, and the $400 billion for child care, $150 billion for home care, and there's a little line out for $35 billion for Medicare hearing care coverage, which would have provided Medicare hearing services and prescription hearing aids for older adults, right? So how did this happen? And the, from the words of one policy staff we talked to, they said we're, we, we captured the imagination of policymakers about the importance of hearing loss, right? And um, I'll, I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that in one second. That's, those are their words, not mine, but sort of the idea of capturing the imagination of policymakers. And I think another reason too is we, we were able to, through our policy briefs, through our op-eds, maybe through the cartoon, the comic, who knows, we provide a clear and fiscally viable plan for implementation, namely, in the beginning, dental and vision was also being considered for coverage. Dental got dropped because it was basically too expensive. Hearing our coverage, because we're saying we could leverage the OTC hearing aid market, it became an infinitely more affordable option for Congress makers. If you're not covering hearing aids for you know, 40 million Americans, you're just covering hearing care services for many people, which are a lot cheaper, and hearing aids, just prescription hearing for those with moderately severe grade hearing, which is on order of a few million people. So we actually made it financially viable by saying the stage of the over-counter hearing aid act. Um, capturing the magic, what I mean by this, this is a town hall that President Biden had with Anderson Cooper um, uh, back in October 2021. And Mr. Cooper asked, uh, one, of the, one of the things that Democrats are looking to do is expand Medicare to include hearing, vision, dental. Around this time period, it was likely not going to pass because of um, opposition from a couple of senators in Congress. But if you just skip down before, and I apologize, it's very circuitous to read this because as probably many of you know, President Biden has a, has a, has a, has a uh, as a stutter, so he often talks around a lot of things. That's, that's how he talks, it's a little painful to read. But he basically, this is President Biden saying, and the hearing is a very important thing because as Kirsten Cinema, Senator from Arizona Sports, this points out, hearing is directly related to dementia. When you can't hear, you have a problem that impacts on dementia. It's basically already, it's reached a high level of Congress government about the importance of hearing loss, hence idea of capturing imagination. And I love what he writes down, what he, what he says down below then. And he says, making excuse now, so we're able to, uh, we're, we're actually able to take care of hearing without even Medicare, because what's happening now is with these hearing aids companies, you're no longer going to go to the doctor and you can basically get OTC hearing aids. So we're at the highest levels of government out there to influence a conversation. Again, we hopefully think through some of our communications, we don't know, but something's working at least. Um, at the same time, the National Plan to Address Alzheimer's Disease 2021 update, now hearing, treating hearing loss, addressing hearing loss, is actually a fundamental core recommendation from the National Plan to basically hopefully reduce the risk of dementia. Again, so the idea of capturing the imagination now through a formal policy document coming from the, from the, from the U.S. government and Department of Health and Human Services. So my, this is my last slide. Um, the Build Back Better Act, as probably many realize, is currently stalled in Congress right now. Uh, our initiatives over the next year are going to be focused on um, efforts uh, on the possible reintroduction of the Medicare hearing benefit in the next year. Um, in particular, with the chief trial results coming in the next year, this may hopefully serve as impetus. Uh, the last thing we're doing, the National Academies we've been planning for the last year, um, is a, a workshop where this all began with over counter hearing, actually, a workshop on hearing care coverage in the era of OTC hearing. It changes the dynamic of how insurance companies think about covering hearing care when we have OTC hearing, so that's in progress as well. So, actually, I'm sorry, this is my very last slide. And just to summarize again, we, we work across a lot of areas. You'll be hearing more from other core faculty members this morning, but I just want to highlight this morning and we saw the three key initiatives that we're working on over the next year. And again, if you join us next year, hope to report back on, on how those initiatives are going. Um, so I apologize, but I'm a minute over time. I want to finish up there. and. And thank you again, more importantly, for coming and joining us in person. This, this means a lot because we feel a lot can be done more in person than, than virtually sometimes. Thank you again. <laughs> and I am thrown out. We're going to skip questions for me because I, I ran over a little bit with the intro. Um, we're going to go to um, Jennifer Deal next, who is our Associate Director of Academic Training. Who, uh, Mindy, I might need your help. I can't find my arrow. So thank you everyone and good morning. I'm really delighted to be here. I'm gonna do a couple of things today. So I hope to present a little bit of research that we're conducting currently at the center. 
But I also want to start, as Dr. Lynn mentioned, I'm the Associate Director for Academic Training at the Cochlear Center, and it really is our primary mission to train trainees. And so we have a lot of initiatives, some new this year, and I just want to highlight really kind of those new initiatives for us. We are very fortunate in terms of our funding streams that we have a lot of flexibility in those students that we can take on. And so we have a lot of opportunities for students who are enrolled here at Johns Hopkins University in graduate programs and the undergraduate um, program as well. But then we also have a lot of opportunities for students who are not currently at Johns Hopkins. And these fall into different types of trainees. So we have students who are currently getting graduate degrees, maybe a PhD in epidemiology, for example, or an AUD. Um, we also have a number of clinicians and researchers who are already established, many working in the hearing space, but maybe don't have much experience with public health. And so our goal is really to have programs that kind of meet those two groups of learners. And we have a lot of different opportunities for those groups. I'm going to focus a little bit, and Dr. Lynn mentioned this already, um, one of our new initiatives has to do with our fellows program. So our first fellows program really is designed for clinicians and researchers already established working in the field. And so if they're in the public health space, maybe they don't have a lot of hearing expertise, or if they're in the hearing space, the auditory space, maybe they don't really understand the public health viewpoint on aging and hearing. And so we launched our first fellows program back in the summer of 2019. It was one full week in July. Of course, that was a long time ago, um, pre-COVID. So we were actually able to have individuals come to Baltimore. Um, and this program was really focused on our partners who were working overseas. And so the East Asian Fellows Program, um, one week at Hopkins, we had a lot of core coursework covering topics from epidemiology and statistics, all the way up to interventions and, and gerontology broadly. Um, only 35 slots, but a lot of interest in this program, 109 applications. So definitely there's a need and an interest for this type of training. And then fantastic 31 trainees from a number of different East Asian countries. We plan to continue that in the summer of 2020. And in fact, we had applications for a Latin American Fellows Program. And then unfortunately, of course, in March 2020, we realized we would not be able to hold that program in person. But recognizing that you know, we still had opportunities, there were ways we could move forward, we embraced the online format. And our training program, our Fellows Program is now fully online. This photo is taken, it's a snapshot of Course Plus, which is the platform by which the School of Public Health disseminates its courses. And really we partner with others, particularly others um, in different countries, um, to really kind of provide this training. So there's a full online course. And then we had asynchronous Zoom sessions over the summer um, in 2021 to kind of talk through some of these ideas, talk through research ideas. Um, but, but certainly um, now moving forward, we recognize having this online format that really expands our ability to reach others and to be able to provide this training on a broader scale. And so we are very interested in hearing from you. If you are a partner interested in this program, um, um, pictured here on the left is Nadawan, who was one of our East Asian fellows from that first fellows program. And this summer now we're partnering with her and with Chula University to actually be able to provide this training, um, both the online component and then for us to be able to travel, to be able to visit and talk through again some of these concepts. Um, so we're very proud of this fellows program. We owe a, a lot of thanks to the Center for uh, uh, Teaching and Learning here at Johns Hopkins, as well as to some very dedicated staff members who helped make this possible. Along those lines, another new initiative. So that is a program, you know, there's an application process. It's, it's a longer set of courses. But we recognize that there may be some individuals who would still like a little taste of public health and aging when it comes to hearing, but may not be able to have um, participate in that full fellows program. And so for that reason, we just launched, and it's brand new, launched April 1st, um, a massively open online course or a MOOC that is offered through the Coursera platform. And this course is called a public health approach to hearing loss and aging. 
This is free and open to anyone who is interested in participating. We have about seven lectures from Cochlear Center faculty with some quizzes and, and opportunities to engage with others through this platform. So we're hoping this may be another way to get individuals who have training in one space, um, who are interested in, in aging public health and hearing and the intersection um, to kind of um, expand the Cochlear Center's reach and make sure we're meeting those kind of training initiatives for the center. And then finally, I do just want to highlight, we have a lot of opportunities for our students here at Johns Hopkins. We work with master's students, doctoral students, postdoctoral fellows, undergraduates, students who are getting their MDs. We have a number of opportunities for students to receive funding if they're working with us as well. And one of the new initiatives that we started this year was really targeted at our master's level students who are enrolled in a full-time graduate degree program here at the School of Public Health. And so this could be a Master of Health Science degree or a, a, a Master of Science degree. And I would like at this moment to um, recognize our winners. And so please join me in recognizing our awardees this year for the first inaugural scholarship, Claire Anderson, Grace Galan, Jason Smith, and Wu Yang Zhang. Congratulations. <laughs> We're very, very proud of you and, and glad that we were able to provide this support to you. So congratulations. Okay, and I just wanna put in a plug for those of you who are here in person. We do hope that you'll come back and see their work. Um, we have presentations, poster presentations by the trainees this afternoon here in the same room, Feinstone Hall from one to 3 p.m. There will be lunch served and also some um, beverage refreshments too. So we hope that you can join us. So in the last 15 minutes or so, I just wanna talk a little bit about um, a, a key line of research that's happening at the Cochlear Center, and that has to do with hearing loss and dementia and with the aging brain, as Dr. Lin mentioned already. And Dr. Lin mentioned this report. So the Lancet Commission on Dementia Prevention, Intervention and Care released this report first in 2017, and then again in 2020, where they looked at all the potential modifiable risk factors for dementia. And what they concluded was that hearing loss is the single greatest contributor to the percentage of dementia cases around the world. The interpretation of this um, measure, this 8%, is that 8% of the uh, dementia in the world is potentially due to hearing loss. And really wonderfully, that means that if we're able to treat or prevent hearing loss from occurring in the first place, then we could potentially prevent up to 8% of dementia cases. And that is really um, astounding and it's amazing to think about. And the Achieve trial is helping us to um, further investigate this. But what's really important to recognize with this number is that there are some key caveats in terms of its interpretation. It assumes that there's no bias. So we have lots of observational, observational data saying that hearing loss is related to dementia. And the estimate that the Lancet Com Commission gave was 1.9 as a relative risk. So about a 90% increase in the risk of dementia for people who have hearing loss compared to people who don't, right? But that assumes that that 1.9 is the correct number, that it's without bias. Um, and that's something that um, I'm gonna focus on a little bit today. It also means that hearing loss causes dementia. We don't know that yet. The ACHIEVE trial will help us understand that, right? So we don't know that hearing loss causes dementia, but there are some key pathways by which we think it might. And Dr. Lin alluded to these pathways earlier. So this is through increased cognitive load, increased social isolation and loneliness, direct changes to brain structure and function and reduced activity. Of course, it could also be some common cause, you know, things associated both with aging, um, um, for example, like um, increased microvascular disease or, or things of uh, increased inflammation, right? So it is possible that there's these common causes, but we do think there's these causal mechanisms. And what I really want to focus on today, um, because the ACHIEVE trial is going to really kind of help us understand the nature of that relationship, and we've done a lot of work at the center trying to understand the, the relationship, the association between hearing loss and all those different pathways. What I really want to talk about a little bit today instead is more of a kind of methodological concept having to do with bias. So is that 1.9% association between hearing loss and dementia, is that the right one? 
So there are a couple of different ways that bias could creep into our studies. And I'm gonna focus on one, and that has to do with who is included in our study. And so imagine someone is enrolled in a study, they're an older adult, they come to participate, it's a long neurocognitive exam, there's a lot of tests, it takes over an hour. Someone who attends that test uh, or attends that study visit may complete all 10 tests or they may not. And if someone chooses not to complete all of those tests, why, why would they not complete everything? Well, one possibility is that someone with hearing loss has cognitive decline that is related to that hearing loss. And if they have cognitive decline, that test just might be more difficult, so they might choose not to complete it, right? And if that's the case, if we look at missingness of cognitive test scores, we actually would expect, I think, the tests that are more associated with those mechanisms that we discussed earlier, so related to domains of memory and executive function like working memory, we would actually expect those tests to be um, most often not completed. Alternatively, and this is something that we've seen in the literature and some people have, have posed, people with hearing loss maybe don't complete a test because they just don't hear it, right? And that's not measuring their cognition, that's measuring their hearing. And if that's the case, we would think that the test that would be most affected, where we'd see the most missingness among those with hearing loss, would be those where we just are speaking, right? It's an auditory administration, only there's nothing written on paper that they would be able to see. So we directly tested these hypotheses. We used the atherosclerosis risk and community study, the ERIC data set, A-R-I-C. Participants attended visit six. They had complete audiometric data uh, for, for frequency, speech frequency, pure tone average. We had um, just over 3,500 participants in this study. It is a cross-sectional design. We have a really rich neurocognitive battery in ERIC, 10 neurocognitive tests hearing measured with pure tone audiometry. And then we wanted to look at the prevalence of missingness. So just not completing at least one test. And to do that, we estimated um, prevalence ratios comparing people with hearing loss to those with normal hearing using Poisson models with robust standard errors. These are the results of that study. So of the total individuals, we had 851 who did not complete at least one of the 10 tests, 2,827 who completed all 10. On average, people who did not complete at least one test were a little bit older, so 81 years compared to 79.5 for those completers. Um, people who were Black and had less than a high school education also more likely to not complete all tests. And then the same with diabetes also associated. So a higher proportion of individuals with diabetes did not complete all of the tests. This is a very busy figure and it is only meant to show patterns. So on the left-hand side, we have all of the different cognitive tests that were, were given. At the bottom, we have the number of people who were in each pattern group. And there were 89 different patterns of completion of these 10 tests. So first of all, that's astounding. I think we have a lot of different people completing in different ways. The good news is about 75% completed all of them, but we did have um, about a quarter who didn't complete at least one. And you can see the patterns are really all over the place. The most common is everyone completed everything. Um, but there, the most test, the test with the most missingness was a test that we call the trail making test part B. And that was really the second most common pattern. And overall in the cohort, about 17% did not complete that test. So then we estimated the prevalence ratios of, of not completing, um, comparing people with hearing loss per every 10 decibel increase in hearing loss. And I'm only showing here the test where we saw an association. Those were logical memory one and two, the Boston naming test and digits backwards. And for all of those tests for every 10 dB increase in hearing loss, it was about a 20% increase in the prevalence of not completing at least one test. And for trail making tests, then the estimate was a 14% increase in the prevalence. Importantly, uh, three of those tests, auditory only, it's an oral administration, but two of those tests are pen and paper, 
Right? So that to me suggests that um, particularly maybe through these mechanism of cognitive load, individuals are getting fatigued. The trail making test is the hardest test in our battery. It comes towards the end of the battery. So I think individuals were just tired uh, with hearing loss, right? And so chose not to complete that over time. And then beyond this, we wanted to understand its impact, right? So if this is true, we see that people with hearing loss are less likely to complete. What does that mean for our results? And so all of these tests here that you see where we saw individuals with hearing loss were less likely to complete, we ignored them. We just went with the test where everyone was equal in terms of completion. And then we were able to use an advanced statistical technique um, one analysis, we just ignored the missing, which is commonly what we do in these types of studies. But in the other, we had a whole host of auxiliary cognitive information available in the ERIC study. And so we were able to use multiple imputation to understand what individuals' test scores would have been based on their covariates and everyone who did complete the tasks, um, had they actually been able to complete. And so here we're comparing the analyses when we ignore the missing versus the multiple imputation. I'm just highlighting here again that these are only the tests where everyone, there was no difference in terms of completion by hearing loss status. And what we see is that hearing loss, when we model it continuously, is associated in both analyses with um, cognitive perform lower cognitive performance. So for every 10 decibel increase in the analysis where we ignored the missing, that was associated with a 0.6 um lower standard deviation score on the, the neurocognitive tasks and then when we look at the multiple imputation actually now it's stronger right so it's a stronger association when we impute and when we look by category we actually even see that our inference changes because when we ignored that missingness mild loss suggested an association 0.07 standard deviations difference but it only becomes statistically significant when we use the multiple imputation approach and so just to summarize those findings, we, you know, people with hearing loss, even those who came to the visit, they were healthy, came to the visit, less likely to complete cognitive testing compared to people without. And then that missing cognitive data did bias our results. It underestimated the relationship between hearing and cognitive performance. And again, I point out this is true even for the non-auditory tasks. And so I know, you know, kind of getting close to time, I think in the last minute, I'll just say this really begs the question about what then are best practices for measuring cognition in older adults who have hearing loss or vision loss, other sensory loss. And we were interested in addressing this question. We had some amazing help from two um, individuals pictured here, Chelsea Liu, who is now getting her PhD at Harvard, and Nini, who's pictured here at the time she was a postdoc over in ophthalmology. We did a systematic review and this was not to identify individual studies, it was to in identify individual cohorts. So we wanted cohorts with a prospective design, at least 200 participants, at least age 60 or older, we wanted to focus on older aging. We wanted cognitive testing to be a core component of that co cohort, so we had at least two neurocognitive tests. And we wanted to contact them with a survey, so results had to be published within 10 years. We started out with over 82,000 hits when we did our review and um, ended up with 228 unique cohort studies. We did not, we were not able to locate contact information for 36. So to those who we had a contact, we um, administered a survey about whether they measured sensory function as part of their cohort, and if so, how they measured it. We did have a number of, of non-responses. I, I think you know, many of us were impacted by COVID trying to do this work. But in the end, we had 85 total studies who responded with their protocols about how they measured sensory function in their cohort where their goal was to measure cognition. And what we found was not surprising. So there was variation in how it was assessed. The good news is 90% of studies assessed at least one or the other. But there was variability in exclusion. So 8% had exclusion due to frank impairment. Um, but it may much likely be higher. So sometimes individuals who are there, um, you know, may be flagged by the administrator saying that they think that their uh, hearing, for example, interfered with their ability to, to take the cognitive test. 
We do highlight that some studies offered accommodations, 22% for hearing loss, like a pocket talk, talker and amplifier, and 38% offered some accommodations for vision loss. And so just you know, to kind of summarize some considerations, I think that we as a field should be thinking about what those best practices are for how we measure cognition in individuals with, with sensory loss. Right now, there is a lack of standardization in the field. Importantly, I don't think we can just exclude. Right. I have a test that you can't take doesn't mean that you don't get to participate in my study. We know that sensory loss is important for a number of um, adverse health outcomes. And so it's important to make sure those individuals have the chance to participate in our studies. We need individuals who have hearing loss, sensory loss to be able to participate because we use that information to base policy decisions and clinical decision making. So we need them included. And as we showed, you know, exclusion can actually bias results and give us the wrong result. So importantly, some considerations, you know, if there's exclusion, it should be based on the science, not on the way in which I want to run my study. I think there's this question of accommodations for individuals if they ask versus universal accommodations, depending on the research question. And really important when we're writing up this work to make sure we're reporting the exclusions and accommodations. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge co-authors, and I think we are right at time. So I will go ahead and stop and introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Esther O. Good morning, everybody. I'm Esther O. Um, I'm with the ger geriatricians at Hopkins. Also, I think I, uh, you know, had kind of met with many of you um, the past several years, and actually did not know the exact content of uh, what Jennifer was going to talk about today. But I think it's going to tie in very well. So these are my disclosures. So I want to share two stories with you today. So the first one is the patient who did not wish to go out. So these are my pa real life patients. Um, I kind of altered their age. <laughs> so uh, obviously there are no names attached. So the first one is a 75 year old woman with memory problems who is accompanied by her daughter. Her uh, past medical history includes hearing loss, depression, anxiety, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. It's actually her psychiatrist who referred her to my clinic. And she had long standing depression and apathy, really not motivated to go out, and sees a psychiatrist and a therapist and takes an antidepressant. Um, the daughter said, you know, she becomes really irritable when she's not the center of attention. So um, when she came in and I knew she had hearing loss, and I have a pocket talker, actually, all of our clinic rooms at the uh, Johns Hopkins Memory Alzheimer's Treatment Center, in our clinic rooms, we have pocket talkers. Uh, so I you know, put on a pocket talker to converse with her. Um, she did not have the pocket talker on when she got the MMSC, but it was uh, 22 out of 30 at that time. And she came back for a follow-up visit. So we were doing a workup. Um, I would say probably if I had to give a diagnosis at that time without having all the information, probably mild cognitive impairment, she was mostly functional. Um, and so she now has hearing aids that she obtained from the Hearing and Speech Agency, I think it's in um, Towson, on HASA for $500. So when I first encountered her with her daughter, the daughter said, uh, we really can't afford hearing aids, so that's why she didn't have hearing aids. But now she actually got um, really high quality hearing aids for $500. And her daughter says, it's really made a big difference in my mother. So, you know, my mom used to slur a little bit, but her speech is much more clear. And uh, she's definitely more positive and uh, she's really less frustrated with her primary care physician. She's a, a woman who's very soft spoken. And I think it was because my mom really couldn't understand what she was saying, but she really did not like her primary care physician, but she really likes her now. And she had avoided social gatherings, including her own birthday party. And this was something that was told to me the first visit. You know, they were going to throw a big party for her. And she's like, I don't want to go. It's like, it's your birthday party. I don't want to go. Why? Because people just talk about me. You know, So that's the not, not being the center of attention. I think what it was was that she really couldn't follow the conversations because she did not, you know, she could not hear very well. So when we did the, um, uh, 
memory testing on that day <laughs> after he, getting those nice uh, shiny hearing aids from Hessa, her MMSC was 29 out of 30. And she's still my patient. And uh, just to let you know, um, just because I don't have the follow up slides, um, you know, she had a really rough time during the pandemic and we tried to do telemedicine with her, but really um, just the barrier was hearing loss and uh, she she continues to follow with me six months every six months or so, and she has continued to decline, but you could see that immediately after getting the hearing aids around that time, the score had uh, risen. My next patient is a patient who wished to be called on his phone. So this is a 70 year old gentleman with significant hearing loss hypertension history of a TIA or transient ischemic attack. Um, the family says, um, you know, he's been having memory problems that has kind of progressed over the 10 to uh, 15 years. He's been a very successful businessman, but he's now handed the business over to her, um, his son. Uh, he actually had fairly in-depth neuropsychological testing. Um, the circumstances, I don't really know. I have the report, uh, whether they tested for his hearing or not, I'm not sure. And the official uh, diagnosis he carried was mild cognitive impairment. At that time, his MOCA was 19 out of 30. His communication with me was so difficult that even though he was seated right next to me, he could not hear what I was saying. Now, so the way he usually communicates is, uh, or at least he didn't have problems with uh, phone calls, was he would have his hearing aid in, it was connected to his um, uh, phone, and so he said, can you call me on my phone? So remember, he, like I'm sitting here, he's right next to me, and he could not hear me say, call me so i actually called him on his cell phone to see if we could improve the communication and that's how bad it was and by the way it didn't work um, so basically most of the history was obtained by um uh, from his son um so uh, the communication was very very limited now he did tell me that he had been evaluated for co um, cochlear implant before and he was told that he was not a, a good candidate so um, I work with um, uh, Steve Bodish here, who's an audiologist. Um, I frequently refer patients to him. So I said, you know, I really know a great audiologist. Would you be, you know, willing to be uh, evaluated? And although he lives really far away, he and his son thought, you know, why not? So he actually goes to the audiologist, uh, finds out that, you know, several years late, later now, um, he actually qualifies for cochlear implant, has a cochlear implant, comes back to see me. Um, and uh, he's six months after his surgery, Mocha was 21, and he's kind of still fiddling with the cochlear implant a little bit. And then 12 months later, which was this past Tuesday, his Mocha is 24. So I don't know about you, but I don't know any neurodegenerative disease that actually uh, Mocha score goes over, <laughs> improves over time. So this is not to say that he doesn't have any neurodegenerative process. Now, if you look at his MRI, he has a lot of white matter hyperintensities, you know, he's had a prolonged hypertension. So there's definitely some brain damage. But I wonder, um, as was with my other patient, whether addressing hearing loss is a really, as Frank likes to say, low hanging fruit in terms of really helping them. Um, and so not just uh, in terms of, you know, increasing MOCA scores or, uh, but, you know, with um, what was really remarkable about my, pa my patient encounter with him on Tuesday was that, last Tuesday was that, we had no communication problems. We talked, we laughed. It was just just night and day, so di different. Um, he is, um, you know, his son says that, you know, he, you know, he's happier. And um, his wife actually came with him for the first time. And she said, you know, um, so you're, you have your mask on, but he had this memory testing where they asked, told him 14 words and well, they weren't supposed to, but this person actually took their mask off and you could see their lips. Um, he got like 13 out of 14 words correct. So it was partly hearing loss and there's a cochlear implant that he's still kind of fiddling with. He likes to kind of turn it down a lot because everything is amplified. He's just kind of getting used to his new world, uh, but also you know, a lot of reliance of lip reading. And when that was all provided, he was you know, able to recall 13 out of 14 words, and that's pretty remarkable. So it's probably some verbal learning test, and I don't really know what in what context that was administered. 
But I want to um, so kind of uh, go back to uh, my first lady. Um, so you know, she was somebody who had depression, who had apathy, uh, was an antidepressant, seeing a, a, a therapist for uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, psychiatrist for her antidepressant medications. And what she was suffering was from what's called what we call neuropsychiatric symptoms, which we see in a lot of patients who have cognitive impairment. Uh, so she had the irritability, we talked about um, a little bit of depression, but there's a whole slew of uh, symptoms, loss of interest, delusions, believing in things that are not true, hallucinations, seeing things that are not there, agitation, aggression, uh, resistance to help, I don't really know what's going on, why are you undressing me? This is a big, big problem that we have in like nursing homes, because um, people don't know what's going on, uh, when in fact they're just trying to, you know, provide hygiene. Um, anxiety, um, aberrant motor symptoms, disinhibitions, sleep disturbance, appetite changes, and all those things. Now, although we often think of, you know, somebody has a neurodegenerative process, so it must be some chemical imbalance in the brain that's causing all these problems, and, and that is true. It's definitely making their brain vulnerable. However, I would say that there's a lot of other things that happens when patients have behavioral symptoms associated with, um, with cognitive impairment. So there, we call this direct route. So there's the underlying brain that's highly vulnerable. And what we have is what's called indirect route, which is everything else that basically stresses the brain. So it could be the patient factor, meaning, oh, they might have some underlying infection, um, some sleep problems. I highlighted boredom because when you have hearing loss and you're so isolated from the rest of the world, you're quite frankly bored and you don't have activities that you can participate in. This is one of the probably number one or two reasons why patients get behavioral problems and we don't often um, notice that. Caregiver burden, sometimes we have care, care partners who themselves are older and have hearing loss and so they get into arguments because they really can't hear each other and one of them has kind of getting here. So communication issues, environment, either overstimulation, so cluttered house, or understimulation, not having enough activities. All those things actually are stressors to what is already a very, very vulnerable brain. So we actually did a pilot study um, uh, in our clinic to see, well, you know, if we could just use just a little bit of, um, you know, help um, for these patients, you know, could that improve a lot of the clinical outcomes? So what we did, this was done, I think about six or seven years ago, we just did, tried to do a basically one month intervention where we basically did hearing assessment, um, did um, communication education, and we let them actually choose an over-the-counter device to amplify the sound. And we assess, um, you know, daily functioning, like um, activities of daily living, instrumental activities of daily living, neuropsychiatric symptoms that I had just talked about, caregiver burden, quality of life, and so on. And, you know, we said, well, we're going to show that this is really helpful because we know hearing loss is important. And if we address it, we're going to fix a lot of problems and we're going to disseminate the findings. And so we actually gave them a choice. Um, many of my patients actually ended up choosing Pocket Talker. And what we found was that, I'm just showing you just a, a slice of some of the data that we have. Uh, we basically saw decreased neuropsychiatric symptoms, not in everybody, but those who had really high, uh, so high is worse in um, MPIQ, so really bad um, or worse in um, neuropsychiatric symptoms benefited the most in terms of hearing intervention. And people liked it. 80% said they noticed the benefit when their partner used a listening device. And 95% said the intervention is worth the trouble. So basically getting, um, choosing a device, getting one-time um, communication education, and just we call them at two, two week time point and one month evaluation. But what was really strange was that you now we studied 20 people and all 20 were my clinic patients. And so I see them you know, every four to six months. And what I noticed was that many, if not all of the patients that uh, who underwent this and said this was a great program, in about six months or 12 months, none of them were using Pocket Talker or had lost the equipment. So what do we do? So um, actually, I think Carrie and Jamie um, actually took the trouble to kind of follow up on them. And these are some of the things that was actually happening in the background that I did not realize. So, uh, so basically limited maintenance of device use. Um, so this is some of the quotes that um, they found. Uh, 
So by the time we got home, he used it one day, and then by the next day, we couldn't get him to put it back on. Remember, these are patients who have cognitive impairment. And it was just, a, you know, just days that I tried to get it to use them, it just wasn't going anywhere. So, you know, we gave up. So really needing um, a lot of gap in terms of um, gaps that we need to address in terms of uh, really more um, targeted instruction regarding, you know, how best to use a device and how best to really integrate the device used into daily routine. And then it was just kind of really inconvenient to come to the um, clinic for an assess um, for an evaluation. So what ended up happening at one month was actually, even though a lot of my patients came to the clinic for first evaluation, they said, we can't be bothered, we don't have time, you know, could you come to our home? And, you know, here's one quote, just getting to the doctor's appointment or anywhere at that point was very difficult. So really having options for delivery in multiple settings, including home. And then recognizing the demands that hearing loss is just one part of dementia care, that it's not doesn't help, uh, doesn't help with all aspects, but it is an important part. It was just personally too kind of time consuming for us to do this, you know, and I think when you put too much instructions into it, and we thought we were doing a very simple one day intervention. Uh, for me, at least it kind of says, you know, I don't want to. Okay, mom, we're not doing it. <laughs> you know, it's just too much upkeep on it. So partnering with the care partners to develop an intervention um, that really is responsive to what they're going through at that time. So all these were just really wonderful things that I think um, Carrie, Jamie, and others really discovered by following up on what happened afterwards. You know, why did my patients stop you know, using the pocket covers? So we had refined the intervention. So we actually have an R1 pending. Uh, Hopefully we'll get funded soon. Um, it's called addressing hearing loss as a common unmet, unmet contributor to neuropsychiatric symptoms. And actually my uh, co-PI is Carrie Newman. Uh, so if there are three aims, really first, we wanna refine the hearing care intervention strategy. So we want to interview uh, neuropsychiatric symptom experts, but of course, really, really talking to patients who have dementia themselves with hearing loss and their care partners, you know, like, just giving a scenario, what, what, what is going through your daily life? What are the barriers? How can we help you? And how do we address neuropsychiatric symptoms? And then do an RCT. So the first pilot study, everybody got an intervention. So although, you know, we said, oh, we loved it, you know, it shows some, you know, move the needle in terms of neuropsychiatric symptoms, but it didn't really have a control group. So really doing it properly. And then really figuring out what the predictors of response are, you know, who responds and who doesn't, and what are some of the variables that impact that. So this is innovation. So often, you know, we think of um, innovation as Okay, we will uh, get back to it. So my name is Carrie Neiman. I am uh, one of the otologists here at Hopkins and core faculty at the Cochlear Center for Hearing and Public Health. So um, as we have all thought about and started off the day thinking about the big picture of hearing loss and healthy aging, uh, I'm here to also just enter in the thought about hearing health equity, because as we you know, move forward on the really big picture concepts about hearing loss in the context of healthy aging, we need to make sure that we're bringing all of our older adults along with us. So with that, um, I will be sharing some of the findings from the HEARS RCT. So I do ask for everybody who's here and calling online um, to not share any of this um, in social media uh, as this is um, pre-publication uh, that I will be sharing today. So with that, um, I'll go ahead. 
I have no industry related disclosures. Um, I do serve as a volunteer board member of Access Hears and the Hearing Loss Association of America, um, which if we have time, I'll share a little bit about uh, Access Hears at the end. So what do we know in terms of hearing health equity? I'll just cover some of the basics um, for, for all of us to be on the same page. And really the starting point for the HEARS randomized control trial in terms of how do we think about providing hearing care to all of our older adults. So we know hearing loss is really common. Um, that's where we started today. And something that really is throughout all of our work is the way in which we think and talk about hearing loss. So hearing loss really exists within the context of healthy aging and you know from work that's been done over the past decade much of it from the cochlear center and many others around the world we know that hearing loss has been independently associated with negative outcomes in almost every aspect of aging and so why does that matter when we talk about health equity and hearing health equity i think the way in which i think about hearing care and the way in which we need to be talking about hearing care more broadly is thinking about it as a potentially essential tool for aging well yes i care about the individual's communication you know who's seeing me in clinic but it's really much more thinking about how do i make sure they need what they they get what they need in order to be able to communicate and live and engage in that life they want to have as they age the other thing that is not new for all of us is really universally low rates of hearing aid use or hearing health care so we know that it's around 15 to 20 percent of older adults who have hearing loss actually use hearing aids. We know that those rates have really been quite stagnant over the past um, decades or so. And that's particularly true when we're talking about African-American older adults in terms of hearing aid uptake. And so what we see nationally when we look um, at NHANES data, again, nothing new, nothing that we don't already know, is that rates of hearing aid use are, are different by race and ethnicity. We see just around 10% of African-American and Mexican-American older adults who have a clinically significant hearing loss who actually use hearing aids. We don't see those differences really in terms of hearing screening, which is you know, generally covered by insurance, but we start to see those differences when we think about things like hearing aid use. If we look at another cohort, uh, this is again not nationally representative compared to what we just looked at the last slide, and we see similar findings in terms of within the health ABC cohort, we see differences by race, ethnicity, we see differences by socioeconomic position. Again, nothing that's too surprising given what we know around disparities more broadly within health and healthcare. So we're seeing some of the same themes when we're talking about hearing health equity among older adults. We're also limited in terms of what we actually know about the broad spectrum who makes up US society in terms of our older adults. Really, we know very little in terms of racial ethnic minorities in some of our large epidemiologic studies, right? We think about Framingham cohort, we think about the Beaver Dams cohort, uh, and really few to no minorities, just a few African American individuals, and really not much diversity at all um, within those studies. And then when we talk about hearing related trials or interventions where they were doing something about hearing loss and we look in the past 30 years and fewer than 13 percent of those studies even report race and ethnicity much less even include greater than 30 percent racial ethnic minority representation and i will say of those five that we found uh, three of those are based here at hopkins and represent small pilot studies so we're really limited in terms of what we know so what can we do? Obviously, when we're talking about hearing health equity, there is a whole lot that needs to be done, both from a research perspective and a practice perspective. But what I'll put forward is really thinking about how we deliver hearing care and really aiming for that, how can we make it as affordable and accessible as possible? And just one component of that, I think, is really thinking about and building our models around community-delivered hearing care. So what do I mean by community delivered hearing care? So for me, it's a lot about what it isn't. And I think a lot of what we have currently is clinic based hearing care, which is you know, based within an audiology clinic, within an ENT clinic. And we have these really strict lines about what's delivered solely by an audiologist or solely by a physician. And we're using conventional equipment, technology, soundproof booth, and we really don't always think beyond those kind of strict definitions. So, well then what is community delivered hearing care? And so to me, it is about 
delivering it across really diverse settings. So whether we're talking about in a home or even if we're thinking in a primary care setting or memory clinic setting, those are different than the way in which we uh, traditionally provide hearing care. And we really need to be thinking about partnering with paraprofessionals. Paraprofessionals can mean a whole number of different types of individuals. And we'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by paraprofessionals in a second. And really thinking about as us as audiologists and ENTs, at least in some part of our practice, to be working in a supervisory role and really embracing kind of full mobile technologies, which there are a lot out there, both from a hearing screening perspective, as well as in terms of the technologies and over the counter devices that we use and embrace. So we can think about when we talk about trained paraprofessionals and ENTs and audiologists serving in a supervisory role, we think about task shifting or task sharing. So that's a concept that is, is not new within public health. It is something that within the World Health Organization has been used for many years now. And so what do we mean by task shifting or task sharing? I think it's something that we really need to be thinking about within hearing care and particularly community delivered hearing care. And so task shifting involves the rational redistribution of tasks among health workforce teams, where specific tasks are moved where appropriate from highly qualified individuals to individuals with shorter training and fewer qualifications. Because at the end of the day, this is all about how do we make the most efficient use of the resources that we have. Even when we think about a healthcare setting like the United States, a high resource setting, we will never have enough audiologists, enough ENTs, enough otologists to see all of our older adults with hearing loss. So even in that setting, the best case scenario, we will never have enough. And we really have not been reaching all of our older goals, right? We know that. So when we think about task sharing, then we're really talking about partnering with community health workers and a community health worker model approach to care. Community health workers, that term can mean a whole lot of different things. It can mean, you know, promotoras along the US-Mexico border. It can mean peer mentors, which is the case in which we have worked here within Baltimore with the HEROES project, but community health workers, and as a broad definition, are frontline public health workers who are a trusted member of and or have a usually close understanding of the community in which they serve. And I think the real power behind uh, community health workers is that it is a really kind of demonstrated and go-to model of addressing health disparities. It is a way in which we can reach at-risk individuals and populations and increasingly demonstrated that it is an effective and cost savings approach as well. But it's a model that we haven't really used very broadly within hearing care, particularly when we're thinking about reaching older adults. And so that's really where we come from when we talk about uh, the HEARS program. So the HEARS program, many of you know what it is, but not all. Um, so the HEARS program is really a theory driven intervention that designed to be delivered entirely within a community setting. So at no point is an individual seeing an audiologist or an ENT, but every single step of the process is delivered in that kind of home based community setting and that we fully embrace over the counter hearing technology. And so the HEARS program is delivered in about one and a half to two hours, so one to two sessions, and it's designed to be delivered by a community health worker, so somebody who doesn't have the same level of training as an audiologist or an ENT. It really goes through just some basic parts um, and starts generally with the hearing screening, but the vast majority of the program is spent on just doing a step-by-step fitting an orientation to an over-the-counter device, and then um, some basic oral rehabilitation in terms of communication strategies, expectation management, um, and again, delivered for years by an older adult peer mentor. The devices that we have used over the years have changed to some degree, um, and they're really not meant to be uh, the end-all be-all, but these are the devices that we have used in the trial. So most recently we've used the Super Ear, and then we've used SoundWorld Solutions Sidekick, or also known as the Companion, depending on how it's marketed. Um, so two different devices, one that is larger, easier to use in terms of manual dexterity, uh, and then a smaller device that looks more like a traditional hearing aid. All of these are either using kind of traditional batteries that you can easily find or rechargeable. And what was really important for us too is that the smaller device, that the individual did not have to own a smartphone in order to use that device, which is something that we see you know, as an issue with a lot of over-the-counter technology to come. So that's a little bit about the devices. And again, the program is designed that you can sub in and out whatever, you know, the new technology that comes out onto the market, but these are the two that uh, individuals could choose from. 
Here are some examples of the, the materials uh, in terms of what they look like, in terms of you know, high black-white contrast, really kind of trying to use meaningful icons. It's written at a sixth to seventh grade reading level. So these are some of the, the ways in which we tried to, to be able to make it as older adult friendly as possible. Here's an example of kind of that step-by-step -step fitting and orientation we go through. So the peer mentor, you know, will demonstrate a particular step, have that individual practice it, and then they'll do it themselves and kind of teach back. Um, so really every little piece of the way from turning the device on, putting it on their ear, getting comfortable interacting with it, um, are all part of what we do in that one and a half to two hours. Um, as you can see here, um, the training of our peer mentors, you may recognize some familiar faces here. Um, and so these are a couple of our peer mentors going through their training, uh, learning how to use a pocket talker, for example. Um, and then here is another picture from our peer mentors. And you may, they may look very different than who we kind of think of as traditional hearing care providers. But I will tell you, they very much view themselves as professionals in terms of delivering um, a program in their communities. And so the whole starting point um, was the pilot study that was done now a number of years back. And so in the pilot study, we found basically what, what you'd expect to find in that communication function improved most three months after um, the intervention for those who came in with the most kind of difficulty with communication. Um, so they were the ones who had the, the, the most um, in terms of uh, improvement. And so what we saw in terms of the mean change in communication function, this was measured by the HHIES or the Hearing Handicap Inventory for the Elderly, the screening version, which is what we also used in the randomized control trial. And so we saw mean change of about 10 points. So a 10 point improvement in communication function. Again, that number doesn't mean so much on its own, right? But what we're seeing is a really large effect size. And if you look at the literature in terms of gold standard hearing aids fit by an audiologist, our pilot study we're seeing, you know, just in line with that two hour intervention delivered with, you know, in the, in the community with an over the counter device. So that was the starting point um, for the, the larger randomized controlled trial. So in the trial, we're really looking to see, does a model of hearing care that is designed specifically for older adults that's delivered entirely outside of a clinic setting and is delivered solely by an older adult peer mentor, less than two hours using over-the-counter technology, does it work? That's really what we're looking for in the randomized control trial. And so we had a three month delay treatment group. Our primary endpoint was at three months uh, post randomization. Uh, so we could compare those who received the intervention right away to those who received it uh, three months later after that three month delay. And our primary outcome, just like in the uh, pilot, was a change in communication function. We also looked at things like depression, loneliness, quality of life. I'll share some of the results, but not the full results for all of these, but just the, the kind of the big exciting things. And our goal was for 100 individuals and very much done in partnership with our community partners um, that are affordable senior housing. So everybody were independent, community dwelling older adults, um, as well as the Baltimore City Health Department. And so we had a goal of 100 individuals and we did randomize 151. Um, we had the capacity, but I think even more so, we had an expectation by the community partners that we were going to try to deliver and reach as many people as possible. And so that's why we, we went uh, even further. So we screened 348 individuals to get to that 151. Um, we had 13 community sites all around Baltimore City and Baltimore County. Vast majority were affordable senior housing, again, independent um, community dwelling individuals, senior centers as well, took place over 18 months and was a, a huge undertaking um, by two research assistants and a research coordinator um, who, who made this all happen um, in terms of our 13 community sites. You can kind of see them around Baltimore City and Baltimore County to kind of get a sense of the different places that made up our cohort. So now I'll share in terms of who our cohort was, and I think that's something that is really different um, from our from the traditional hearing related studies. So we can first just look at self identified race and ethnicity and so what we see is that around 43% uh, identified as black or African American and that is you know much higher than what we see. Um, in, in many studies. And while that number of 65 individuals may seem pretty small, this actually represents one of the largest cohorts to date in the United States of African American individuals with hearing loss who are in a hearing related trial. 
We also have vast majority um, low income and again, so one of the largest cohorts to date of low income older adults with hearing loss. The education is you know fairly spread um, across in terms of less than high school high school and some college. And then in terms of just some additional characteristics to keep in mind, uh, the mean age was around 77 years old. Um, the vast majority identified as female, um, you know, just given the nature of kind of where we're recruiting from in terms of affordable senior housing, many of them le lived alone. And I think something that is really uh, important to keep in mind, again, these were all independent dwelling, community dwelling older adults. And their MOCA was on average 23, which puts it solidly in the range of mild cognitive impairment in terms of you know, who these individuals are. They're walking around doing all of their you know, daily tasks, but maybe a very different person we have in mind than who we're thinking about for, you know, especially who industry may be thinking about when it comes to over-the-counter devices. They had uh, you know, the PTA in terms of speech frequency PTA at 42, so really vast majority were mild to moderate. Um, many of them had never used any type of hearing device previously. And then um, almost you know, 50% or so had a smartphone, but you know, a good chunk of them did not have a smartphone. So again, somebody who's very different than I think we're thinking about who may be able to access OTC hearing aids all on their own. So in terms of what are some of the things that we found? So for the peer mentors, if you ask them, um, I think they really had some tremendous insights in terms of, you know, it worked, I think, to, to, many, to many degrees. In that, so the peer mentors would say, and when they reflected, you know, I always tell my clients, you're not alone. I said, I suffer the same problem. I have hearing loss myself. And I say, don't be ashamed. There's nothing to be ashamed of. That's a very powerful message coming from somebody who looks and has that same lived experience than myself and clinic being able to kind of say that to the patient across from me. The importance is because I'm a witness. I myself have a hearing problem and I want you to see me, how it, a hearing device helps me and if it can help you also. That's why it's so important to me because I don't want nobody to go thinking that you can't be helped. And I think they opened up to us. They opened up to us to a lot more because we could relate to where they were, where they are, and what they're going through. So some really powerful, I think, reflections from the peer mentors. So in terms of the primary outcome uh, for the HEARS RCT, so what we saw was that communication function improved um, around 13 points um, from baseline to that three month post intervention. So a really nice, very clear um, improvement and a treatment effect that equals to an improvement in an individual's hearing handicap from severe to no impairment based on the HHIES. And then we also looked at health related quality of life, which is a measure that has been used in many hearing related trials. Um, we asked individuals because there's a mental health component and a physical health component to the SF12. Uh, and we asked people to think about their hearing in the context of the, their physical uh, health. And so that's what's displayed here is the, the physical health component of that. And so many have tried to use this more generic measure of health related quality of life. Um, in their trials, and we haven't really seen much effect in hearing aid trials in the past. Um, it's really been mixed, but we saw, again, not as strong or as clear in terms of communication function, but we did see a significant improvement in uh, health-related quality of life three months following uh, the intervention, and much greater uh, magnitude than has been reported in other hearing aid trials. So what is next? So what's next in terms of HEARS in Maryland? We're really excited to be able to expand HEARS now to try to see, can we do this beyond just Baltimore City, Baltimore County? And can we start to do this in a way in which we can partner with individuals that can grow uh, more broadly than just you know, a one-time uh, study? So we're partnering with local area agencies on aging, so the AAAs, um, which are really a large network throughout the United States that provide aging services. And so we're doing uh, an urban Urban, suburban and rural setting um, to roll out, uh, be able to recruit peer mentors and kind of do uh, to some degree a little bit of the same, but to understand on the implementation side of things, what are those things we need to be successful um, to spread this even further and can we, can we do this? 
I think more broadly where we stand, um, I think it's really important to think about the context of which these results um, and really more work needs to be done. You know, there, we are at a really important time period, you know, 2016, we had the National Academies uh, report that called out specifically these number of different ways we needed to move in terms of making care more affordable and accessible. Um, and, you know, called for over-the-counter hearing aids and called for more community-delivered hearing care quickly followed in 2017 with the passage of over-the-counter hearing aids, and then in 2021 with the World Report on Hearing, which again called out things like task sharing as a way that we really need to be thinking about the future of uh, hearing care. And so I really urge us to say this is just the start, you know, for hearers, but many other, um, much other progress needs to be made um, in many other communities and uh, populations to be thinking about how can we leverage this unique opportunity and keep pushing further. So I think some of the things that we can take away um, is that we all know hearing care disparities, they exist. Um, who we have at the table, who we have in our studies matters. Uh, and we really need to make sure we're doing as good a job as possible to have everybody at the table. Um, approaches that cross disciplines, much of what we talk about, you know, here with peers and throughout the center does not happen without us crossing disciplines. Uh, and that community delivered models uh, may be a promising advance when we're thinking about addressing hearing care disparities and our uh, amazing HEARS team over the years. Um, and again, this is all about our older adults, right? Um, and how do we keep them at the center of what we do? And a big thank you um, to many of our team members um, over the years. And yeah, I'll, I'll pause there then for questions. So thanks so much. We have time for one question. If anyone has a question in the room, or please post a chat online if you have a question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Natalie Phillips is speaking. Thank you so much. That was a really impressive project to hear about. Um, what are you anticipating as some of the challenges as you start to move into the rural communities? Yeah, this <laughs> is um, so good question. I, you know, we've tried from the beginning to think about ways to make it as accessible as possible, and I think the rural setting is something that is is going to be a challenge for us because our current version of here's, you know, a lot of this was all done pre pandemic. Um, and I think so much of this is so hands on. Uh, I think the older adults have really appreciated being, you know, so close, you know, one on one um, to be able to, to get comfortable. Let's let's practice putting on the device. Let's troubleshoot this, you know, and I think that's where the magic happens is that one on one interaction. Um, but as we think about scaling and reaching, you know, I, you know, I think the push to think about virtual, the push to think about group sessions, you know, how do we optimize, you know, the, the resources that we have, I think are things that I think are going to have to come, um, but haven't been piloted or tested um, in terms of how can we still preserve some of that magic. Um, so I think those are the types of things, especially in the rural setting, especially the virtual. Um, which obviously comes with a lot of other things in terms of do they have access to the technology, do they know how to use the technology, you know, so um, those are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about of, in terms of next steps, but it's obviously many challenges to come, but yeah, no, thank you. All right, so thank you, Carrie, for setting me up for, for my talk. Carrie talked about the public health, clinical, and implementation uh, innovations of the HEARS RCT study. And I'm going to be talking about some of the more methodological innovations that were applied in the HEARS RCT. So I'm going to be talking about uh, modern randomized trial methodology and practice using the HEARS RCT as an example. So. Um, as every epi textbook has, almost as if by law, some statement about how randomized trials are the 
you know, the, the gold standard of evidence for the benefits or harm of a particular uh, intervention. But that innovation, that level of evidence comes at kind of a considerable cost uh, in terms of it has all of the, the challenges of an observational trial, but we have layered on top of that administering, monitoring the, the intervention on top of that observational trial. And we also have an ethical mandate to make sure that we have these trials designed to find any meaningful benefits and or harms that come from an intervention, as well as minimizing the duration of a particular trial. So we want to get things out into the public as quickly as possible, as soon as we know. So this leads us to the, the million dollar questions before inflation of how much information do we need to collect? And how do we collect and use that information as efficiently as possible? Okay? So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. So even though I say that this is modern randomized trials methodology, uh, it's kind of a little a bit of a abuse of terms because some of these are, are relatively modern, but some are more underutilized. And for those that are kind of maybe a little bit squeamish around statistical notation and things like that, we're going to see a lot of familiar friends along the way. So if you're comfortable with t-tests and regression and things like that, have no fear. We're just going to be using them in slightly different ways. So I'm going to illustrate how to put these into practice using data from the HERES pilot and the HERES RCT. So every randomized trial, even if you're dealing with a well-studied and well-characterized population, a condition where you have uh, a, 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 that the natural history is well understood, every trial faces unique circumstances and challenges that can't really be anticipated a priori. There's always, you know, how are things going to affect recruitment, the administration, uptake and adherence of the intervention, how do we keep people in the study long term? And how variable are the outcomes of interest? Or what is the, the, the base rate of the outcome in the, in the control group? All of these things are, you know, very poorly understood at the outset of a trial. We are often in the worst place to design a trial when we actually have to. We're left with a lot of uncertainty because we're dealing with expert opinions and prior studies that may be, you know, in different populations and so on and so forth. And as Yogi Berra says, prediction is hard, especially when it's about the future. So what do we typically try and do? We try and, you know, be conservative and, and expect the worst, but hope for the best. We, we think that maybe recruitment's going to be slower than, than we expect. The uptake adherence uh, of the intervention is going to be lower, or attention is going to be lower, and the outcomes are going to be more variable than, than we, we hope for. But what this can do is this can actually unnecessarily prolong a trial. So that means we need to recruit longer, follow people longer. This in turn inflates costs, delays dissemination of, of information. And for, for sponsors, that can mean less time on patent for their, their, their devices or drugs. Uh, so how do we get that, that Goldilocks trial? It's, it's not too big, not too small, but, but just right. And we want to make sure that we're doing that without sacrificing performance. We want to get the same level of statistical power and precision, but getting that sooner. How can we do that? And we can do that by using a judicious choice of, of a, a study design and a statistical analysis plan that takes advantage of two things, the information we're collecting and then judicious choice in timing our analyses. So beginning with the HERES pilot study, as, as, as Carrie set me up so nicely to do, we had a, a sample size of 15 individuals. So we're, we're basing our future study on a sample size of, of 15 individuals. The primary outcome was the, the Hearing Handicap Inventory for the Elderly Short Form, or HHIES. Uh, and the, the sample had a median HHIES of 20 with a, an interquartile range of 16 to 22. And we saw that in the intervention group, we saw a mean change from baseline of, of 8.5 points with a standard deviation of 15.4. So we have quite a bit of variability in, in that. Uh, and here you can see that in the scatter plot, you see that there's a, a strong correlation between the base, uh, baseline HHIE score on the x-axis and then the change from baseline on, on the y-axis. So 
we do see a, a particularly strong signal here, but again, we're, we're basing that on, on 15 individuals. And when we're translating from a pilot study to a, a larger study, there's always worries about, are we, we getting at the same population in terms of recruitment? Are there any changes in the intervention or how we're delivering things that might impact? How are all these things gonna, gonna impact our future study? So we've got a lot of uncertainty in this pilot sample that we have to kind of plan for the worst and hope for the best. And also, we have this additional information that we have from the other variables that we're collecting at baseline, such as someone's age, someone's HHIE scores, their speech frequency, pure tone average. How can we all also leverage that in our analysis? So when we're planning a, a trial, usually we're basing something on the effect size. So for the, the hearing world, you, you may be comfortable with a, a signal to noise ratio. We can think of this effect size as a signal to noise ratio, okay? In the numerator, we have the difference between the treatment group and the control group. That's our signal of interest. And in the denominator, we have our variation in the outcomes, which we can think of as the, the noise in the environment. So when we've got a lot of, of noise or we have a, a lot of variance, that means we have less precision in estimating our mean outcome and our treatment and control groups. And so we have less precision for estimating the difference between those things. So when we've got low variance, we have more precision and it's easier to distinguish meaningful differences in harms and uh, benefits. So if you've got a smaller effect, uh, you're gonna need a larger sample size to determine that uh, with, with the same level of uh, precision and power. But again, in that formula, all you see is treatment and control. That's one variable. What about all the other things we collect, like the HHIE, the pure tone average, and so on and so forth? How do we bring that in? Well, we do that the same way we do that in, in other epidemiological work with a statistical model using regression. Uh, this is also called the analysis of covariance, which is basically a fancy way of saying we're predicting the final outcome, such as the hearing handicap at follow-up using the treatment and pre-randomization variables, such as age, pure tone average, or HHIE scores. We do pre-randomization because anything that occurs after randomization could be affected by treatment, and so those could potentially be mediating variables. So here on the right-hand side, we have our, our, our outcome at follow-up, and then we have our treatment, our baseline level of the outcome of HHIE score, age, and so on and so forth. So we can put all those variables in our regression model. And the way this works is basically it's reducing the unexplained variability, which basically gives us increased precision. Again, you know, think about the signal to noise ratio. We're reducing the noise by explaining that variability. So that basically allows us to boost our signal to noise ratio without changing the signal. And depending on how strongly your variables are correlated with that outcome, you can see up to a 30% reduction in the number of individuals you would need in your study. Although this, this can vary considerably. So your mileage may vary, don't bank on a 30% reduction and, uh, and, and hope for the best. The other advantage is this reduce, uh, reduces bias because when we randomize two groups, we're always going to see some degree of difference between you know, group A and group B. We're most concerned about when those are meaningful variables like their, their level of hearing handicap, their pure tone average, things like that. So if we don't bring those into our model, then those could potentially confound our estimate of the treatment effect. So if you see lower uh, HHIES scores at baseline, adjust for it. Don't just ignore that. And then you also get the added benefit of the increased precision. So I often get asked, you can do this? Yes, yes, you can do this. In your primary analysis? Yes, yes, you can do this. The, actually, the FDA and EMA East ICH guidelines actually encourage you to do that, to use the, the, the this information. I know this is starting to sound like an infomercial, but um, and then you you might say, Josh, you know, I took statistics, and you know, you always ingrained in me that 
what if your model is wrong? Aren't all models wrong? I'll say, yes, you paid very close attention. That's an excellent concern. But we've actually shown that even if your model is misspecified, you can still get good statistical performance. Uh, so you shouldn't have to worry about whether or not you have the exactly right form of the model. Uh, what if I've got a binary outcome? Can I do that? Yes. Basically, all we do is we do logistic regression, and then we do some magic with the logistic regression. So again, we're not doing you know, very high-tech, complicated things. These are all your familiar friends from your statistics courses. Uh, what if you're dealing with ordinal or time to event outcomes? Can you do adjusted analysis there? Yes and yes. Um, for just about any S demand of interest, you know, we can have these sorts of regression uh, adjustments that take into account those uh, factors and give you increased precision. Uh, one of the, the banes of existence of, of, uh, of uh, longitudinal studies is missing data. So can we incorporate missing data into these models? Absolutely. We do this like Jennifer talked about using uh, either inverse weighting or, or uh, 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 multiple imputation. Here, we, we, re we recommend inverse weighting using a, guess what, logistic regression. So nothing terribly new here. These are all our old friends from statistics courses which basically weight the people who complete the study according to how similar they were to dropouts at baseline in terms of their, their age, their, their hearing handicap, their pure tone average, and so forth. Well, what if I've got longitudinal outcomes? I've got, let's say, uh, an outcome at three months, six months, and 12 months post-randomization. Can I use all of that information in one model? Yes, you can. We do that using something called targeted maximum likelihood. So this actually has less restrictive assumptions than some of the models that people might otherwise choose. And, you know, this sounds really technical, really fancy, targeted maximum likelihood, very impressive. But all it is, is it's a sequence of regression models. That's all it is. We're doing, you know, linear logistic regression. That's all it is. You can also incorporate machine learning. That's a talk for another day. Uh, but again, what if our model is wrong? So here we've got doubly, uh, the, the, the property being something called doubly robust, which gives us two chances to give us, uh, get it right. So if our outcome or our missingness model are correctly specified, we're actually going to get good performance. So how do we do this in practice? We need to choose our covariates a priori and put those in the statistical analysis plan. So what we want to look at is what outcomes are associated, or what predictors are associated with our outcome of interest. So think through your table one at the end of the day and think of what are the variables that I do not want to see imbalance between my treatment groups. Those are the ones you should be adjusting for. Okay. So if they if they're worried about if you're worried about imbalance in table one, adjust from missingness. We've got inverse weighting, which uh, will allow you to uh, deal with things at the analysis phase, but you should always try and minimize the, the amount of missing data in, in the first place. And the, 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 the bang for your buck is going to depend on how strongly related these variables are to your outcome of interest. And so since we don't know the benefit from the start and each study is going to face its own unique challenges, it's hard to really bank on a 30% improvement if you're not sure that you're going to get it. You, again, you want to be conservative and, and uh, plan for the worst, hope for the best. So enough of me babbling and throwing jargon at you. Let's see this in action with the here's RCT data. So again, we uh, plan for an effect size of 0 0.6, uh, which would have required a, a sample size of 120. But you know, in order to count to up to 20% loss to follow up, we inflated that to 150. And then all of our analyses were adjusted for whatever the baseline outcome was. So if we're using the HHIES follow-up, we adjusted for HHIES at baseline, along with speech frequency, pure tone average, and age. And we see that for the most part, these characteristics are very well balanced between our, our, uh, the people who are immediately treated versus those in the wait list. And we see that very uh, staggering change in uh, HHIES in the intervention arm compared to the control. 
So you'll notice that even the, the HHIES scores were perhaps a, a point or two higher in the uh, immediate group rather than the waitlist controls. And just like in the, the, the pilot study, we saw an association between, you know, the, the baseline and the, the, the follow-up, where people who had higher scores were going to have larger declines. And so the, uh, the pooled standard deviation of the HHIS, remember our, our denominator, our noise in the, the, the signal to noise ratio was 8.9 if we don't take into account any additional information. Uh, but if we use the ANCOVA, we reduce that by 15%, which gives us uh, basically uh, would still have power to detect uh, a sample, uh, 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 an effect size of 0.51 at no additional cost. And uh, we'd still have, and since we didn't bank on this, we still have adequate power, even if those things were not related. Uh, but the thing is, your, your usual friends at T-Test and ANCOVA assume that data is missing completely at random, that it's not like people who are older, or people with more severe hearing or things like that, are more likely to, or less likely to be followed up. Uh, and so we use the, the doubly robust technique that basically relaxes this really, really strong assumptions. Uh, but we can only adjust for what we measure and measure well. So let's see the, the uh, uh, see things in action. So we see that the adjusted and unadjusted estimates, unadjusted is your, your t-test with a 13.9. You'll see that the ANCOVA and the doubly robust estimators are actually very similar, but you'll see that the confidence intervals are a little bit more narrow. So why didn't we, why are these things so similar? Well, we actually had good balance on all those characteristics and then very weak associations between the missingness and the, 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 these variables. So you can think of this as an insurance policy against imbalance, missingness, and perhaps your effect size not being as large as you thought it would be. So how do we do that? Um, again, we, we plan for the, the worst, hope for the best. Uh, we can do uh, uh, plan our analyses using pre-planned looks at the data and stopping rules, something called group sequential designs or information monitoring designs that allow us to stop early if we've already collected enough data, okay? So there are some assumptions to these, these group sequential designs and things that, that may be violated in some cases. We have a, a working paper in our package forthcoming on how to, how to address those to make this, again, as, as simple as possible. So in short, you can and should use baseline information. There's free software out there. It covers just about every outcome type you can imagine. Uh, it's a, a good insurance policy and gives you additional precision power from the data you're already collecting. You're using less restrictive assumptions rather than what people usually expect. Uh, so again, plan for the worst, hope for the best, put these things into practice, and consult your friendly local statistician colleagues for help early and often. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Questions? <laughs> Glad I looked the part. <laughs> um, so your comments are in the context of RCTs. So what do you do when you've got observational studies of groups that are not randomized, um, and you've got differences between groups but in age or education? Or how, do you, how, do you, how do you go about, um, maybe you don't want to control for those, you investigate them. So I, I appreciate the comments. Yeah, that, uh, that's a, an excellent question is in RCTs, we are randomizing treatment. Okay, and so treatment's going to be unrelated to, you know, baseline characteristics and things like that. What about observational data? I would say you should consult and work closely with uh, a statistician who can help you think through what are you trying to learn about? What are the assumptions under which we can uh, say that something has a particular benefit or harm or things like that, and thinking through the, the, the causal questions and the appropriate methodology to address those. Uh, epidemiologists as well, um, but like that's a, a very complex issue of how to deal with uh, observational data, especially if you're trying to make causal claims about a particular uh, 
uh, uh, intervention or, or treatment. Right. We have time for anyone? So Dr. Emanuel, if you have a question or I have a question. So in some types of interventions, uh, the study sites have different uh, sociodemographic characteristics and, and those type of differences are introduced in their randomization process. Suppose that you have that and yet we still have imbalances in your covariates, in your uh, characteristics of your sample. Can you still apply this type of methods even though it's not it's randomized in a particular way? Absolutely. So uh, Emmanuel is asking about uh, if you have demographic characteristics by site. Uh, one way in which you can address that at the design phase is do block randomization. So each site will have its own randomization list. So that'll basically balance, uh, you know, uh, within site uh, of who gets treatment, who gets control. But again, that randomization works on average. You know, in any given trial, you're going to see some degree of imbalance. Uh, with block randomization, you can actually use these same things. It's going to be a little bit conservative. But there's also ways in which you can actually incorporate the block design into your analysis and you'll actually get additional improvement in precision additional power and then it'll also mitigate the you you get the mitigation of bias due to the uh, confounding factors so you yes short answer yes long answer yes all right let's see if i can any any other questions? All right. Now let me introduce Dr. Nick Reed. Um, let's see if I can actually remember how to switch these slides. Morning. They put me in between a really great talk on statistics and the <laughs> keynote to just sort of give you a mental break for a few minutes. You don't have to think very hard. <laughs> as Josh was talking, I was thinking about he's making it sound like stats is, you know, so simple, but it's it's much more simple than that. If the p value is less than 0.05, that's all that matters. I mean, and if it's less than 0 0.001, you deserve a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk this morning a little bit about uh, some new work that I've done um, with some members of my team, looking at the association of hearing loss and specifically satisfaction with care and really whether or not it's modifiable. Um, quick disclosures, uh, I am funded by some grants from the NIA specifically and uh, I sit on the Scientific Advisory Board of Neosensory and of course I'm faculty at the Cochlear Center for Hearing and Public Health. It's not a good talk if you don't start with a big, you know, epi slide. Um, just reminding everyone, uh, I know everyone in the room knows this, but for, for our friends who are not deep in the hearing research, you know, the prevalence of hearing loss increases with age, uh, such that in the United States, if we use uh, clinical hearing measures, when we get over the age of 60, almost half of all adults have a clinically meaningful hearing loss. And as others have pointed out this morning, the use of hearing aid is hearing aid uptake is, is relatively low. Um, you see estimates anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of adults with hearing loss have hearing aids. Um, but I think a key word in this slide is that they use hearing aids. And so this is data from a national representative survey looking at adults with clinical measures of hearing loss uh, 50 years and older and those who own and use their hearing aids. And if you use that use variable, it's actually lower. It's only 16.4% according to this data. And building off of everyone's talks this morning, we've seen just an explosion of work looking at how hearing loss fits into healthy aging. Um, cognitive vitality, avoiding dementia, avoiding injury, maintaining physical activity, physical function. But what I want to key in on is health resource utilization. And so when I approach this work, uh, our team approaches it through a framework that we've worked on where 
an adult may have hearing loss and they get into the healthcare system and they experience communication barriers that lead to poor treatment understanding, sensory deprivation, causing isolation, environmental awareness concerns, confusion, communication breakdown, causing frustration and stress. And when I say stress, I actually mean physiologic stress on the body, which can have an effect on your uh, care during your stay. This leads to immediate outcomes like safety concerns, delirium, increased length of stay, uh, satisfaction with healthcare changes. And long term changes like healthcare utilization patterns, increased hospitalization, readmission rates. Uh, and over time, I believe there's a synergistic effect that this changes the way you seek care in the future. So, as you can imagine, if you experience poorer care and you're less satisfied with your care more regularly, um, you become more likely to not seek care in the future. It's sort of a you know, slippery slope to go down. I'm going to key in for a second on the mediators. This is an area of work, um, the patient environment communication, an incredibly important area of work. The Institute of Medicine released this huge report in 2001 that indicated patient environment communication was this cornerstone of patient centered care. It's the quality chasm report. Patient centered care is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values. You know, I think the key word there in this context is really needs. Right, you know, hearing, adults with hearing loss may actually have different needs in the healthcare system. And we know patient parent communication is related to important healthcare outcomes, time of diagnosis, treatment understanding, long-term post-hospitalization outcomes. But for those with hearing loss, they may have limited communication. And this is not a slide for those of you who already know a lot about hearing loss, but for our friends who perhaps know less, when you have hearing loss, you have damage in the ear for most age related hearing loss, peripheral damage in the ear, such that when you hear a sentence like, you should go to the pharmacy before you get to your house, it's encoded, it's kind of garbled, sent to the brain for decoding, and the brain interprets it more like this. You would go to RVE before you get to your oo, right? I'm really good at that, by the way. Um, it's not a volume issue. Sound didn't all get softer. It's a clarity issue. I think that's an important fundamental issue are important fundamental sort of fact when we actually think about addressing this. It's communication and how we address communication, not just making everything louder. So going back to our conceptual framework, some of the work we've done to date, just to give you a highlight, looking at the big long-term outcomes. We've used large claims databases, looking at hundreds of thousands of individuals and using propensity matching on uh, socioeconomic, health, geographic insurance variables and looking at their health resource utilization long term. Um, in this study, we have 2,300 adults with hearing loss and 2,300 without hearing loss. And if we look over a 10 year period, we see that those with hearing loss spent on average $22,434 more over that 10 year period uh, in healthcare expenditures. And they're actually matched at baseline for their prior two year spending. So we have sort of a good match on their health utilization. Those same individuals over that 10 year period had an increased rate of hospitalization by 47%. They spent 2.5 days longer during their, their hospital days. That's on average, which is a fairly long time. 44% uh, increased risk of a 30 day readmission and 17% increased risk of experiencing emergency department visits. We've also, and what I wanna key in on today, looked at satisfaction. And satisfaction with care is, can sort of seem nebulous, right? Um, but it's an incredibly important patient-centered variable. It reflects what your expectations were for your healthcare visit and whether they were met. Um, some people sort of make fun of satisfaction. I'll tongue-in-cheek say things like, well, it could literally just reflect that you got green jello instead of orange jello. It's true. But at a macro level, most people when they look at their healthcare satisfaction are thinking about their interactions with their providers and whether what they were expecting and whether their needs were actually met. Another important thing is that satisfaction is tied to Medicare reimbursement. So it's an incredibly important visit for the bottom line of the hospital. You're actually ranked in the United States based on satisfaction surveys in your region and your reimbursement tier goes up or down based on how you do with those satisfaction scores. We've published in the past a series of papers. This is one of them from medical care where we showed that adult, uh, Medicare beneficiaries, um, 
uh, using the current Medicare beneficiary survey, uh, a survey of an annual survey of 12,000 or so Medicare beneficiaries, those with a lot of trouble hearing had 77% higher odds of reporting dissatisfaction with care after adjusting for um, an Anderson a day health utilization framework and health access framework. So including things like marital status, SES, uh, having a usual source of care, age, race, sex, education, income, general overall health compared to others the same age, functional limitations like ADLs and IADLs, and a comorbidity count. So the question though for me starts to become, well, can we do something about this? Um, can we intervene at that level of communication uh, on hearing loss and improve these outcomes? And you might immediately think, well, why don't you just look at hearing aid users in the same data that you're already looking at? But hearing aid users in secondary data and observational data represent sort of a different group. Um, and there's problems with that. It's already associated with many other protective factors, such as higher income, higher education. It also may reflect the underlying uh, mediators like help seeking behaviors. Those with hearing aids may be just more likely to get healthcare, uh, and they have different perceptions of their hearing loss. It's also difficult in a lot of this data to capture hearing aid use if using claims data or EHR data. Um, and we actually have no idea if the hearing aids were used during the appointment. So you may have hearing aids in secondary data, but we don't know if you're using it during your healthcare appointments. Uh, and, some, and from some of our primary research, actually, with um, some of my uh, colleagues at Mass General Hospital, where we've done some hospital-based intervention programs, We've also monitored how many people bring their hearing aids to the hospital and use them. Less than 40% of people who own hearing aids actually bring them to the hospital. So they're almost never there. But accompaniment, what about looking at accompaniment as a modifier? Companions to healthcare visits can act as intermediaries, advocates, they can help almost provide uh, translation and help reinforce information. And they're supplemental information providers. They help with diagnostic history, they can take notes. Um, they're very communication based in a lot of what they can do. So we set out with a hypothesis to look at self-report accompaniment to a healthcare visit and whether it modifies the association, uh, or we believed it would modify the association between hearing loss and dissatisfaction with care. We went back to the Medicare Current Beneficiary Survey from 2016. We use that survey year very specifically because they ask a series of questions that allow us to get at this um, this model. It's a national representative sample of US Medicare beneficiaries. It does include uh, Medicare beneficiaries under 65. It oversamples the uh, population of Medicare beneficiaries who are on uh, Medicare because of disability. It's an interview conducted survey uh, in 2016, 12,027 in total completed the usual place of care module, which included information on accompaniment to healthcare. Our analytic sample was limited to those over 65 years of age. Uh, so we ended up dropping those under 65, which is why we get to 9,698, who also reported engaging with healthcare providers in the past year. So there's also a few that dropped out because they hadn't engaged with anyone in the past year. We looked at three satisfaction variables. There is a fourth one in here, and it's uh, satisfaction with overall cost, but I don't think that has anything to do necessarily with engagement with your providers. Uh, I'm sure in the United States, most people are dissatisfied with cost. Um, the overall quality of your healthcare, the information given to you about what was wrong with you, that's the exact language that they use, um, and the concern of your doctors for your overall health rather than just isolated symptoms or disease. So one is sort of general healthcare quality and the other two are sort of relatively communication based satisfaction variables. Each has an ordinal response scale of very satisfied, satisfied, dissatisfied, very dissatisfied. Uh, for the purpose of this survey, we did leave it as an ordinal, or this model, we left it as an ordinal scale. Um, you will see, though, in the literature on satisfaction, people will often cut it as various binary scales. And um, we did do sensitivity analysis with that as well, and we get the same results. I just left it intact the way it was. Uh, our uh, exposure is trouble hearing. It's self-report functional trouble hearing. And what I mean by that is it's how much trouble, uh, to your, how would you describe your hearing with a hearing aid if applicable? So this is very much a measure of how you're doing in your everyday life. So it's very possible to say you have a hearing aid and have no trouble hearing. So you know, do you have people in the reference category who may have some hearing loss or using a hearing aid? 
Um, the modifier was accompaniment to healthcare visits. And in 2016, they did something a little bit different, which is why I used that year. They also, they didn't just ask if someone took you to a healthcare visit, they asked if they saw the doctor with you. That's sort of an important uh, distinguishing aspect of this. And so our accompaniment variable is that you were accompanied during the interactions with the doctor, or you were not accompanied at all, or the companion transported you to the healthcare visit, but didn't see the doctor with you. Uh, and if you're interested, I'll say up front that we also split this as a three level variable and it doesn't change uh, the inferences for our models. Uh, and in fact, it has sort of a nice dose response as you'd expect where uh, there's sort of this middle ground where if somebody takes you to the visit, you do a little bit better with satisfaction, but not, not as good as if they see the doctor. Uh, in our full sample, we have 5,000 uh, with no trouble hearing, 4,000 with a little trouble hearing, 635 with a lot of trouble hearing. Um, when we split that by uh, accompaniment, uh, I think if I remember the numbers right, it's about 3,436 Medicare beneficiaries in the sample were accompanied to the doctor, and 6,262 were unaccompanied. Um, if you just look at the full sample, I'll just key you in a little bit there on the, on the left, the second column in from the left. Those with uh, a lot of trouble hearing are more likely to be accompanied. So we've actually shown this in other literature too. Hearing loss is associated with accompaniment to a healthcare visit. In the full sample, you know, these findings are not surprising. We see that trouble hearing is associated after adjusting for uh, accompaniment, primary language other than English, age, gender, edu uh, race, and ethnicity, education levels, um, income to poverty ratio, marital status, dementia status, self report depression, functional limitations, and chronic comorbidity count. We see that hearing loss is associated with each of our satisfaction variables. Um, these are ordinal models, so if you want to interpret it, we're not looking necessarily at the odds of dissatisfaction as a straight up binary, we're looking at the odds of going from very satisfied to very dissatisfied. So higher odds moving along that spectrum towards being very dissatisfied. I'll also just key into the group that the unaccompanied to healthcare, or the, the variable of being accompanied to healthcare visits was not associated with satisfaction in the overall population here. So after looking at this, the overall population, which were findings consistent with what we found before, we stratified by, and hopefully that's visible, uh, not too blurry, we stratified by accompaniment. And so to orient you, uh, you're looking at a forest plot here uh, of the odds, and in the top, you're looking at the satisfaction with quality of care, then the satisfaction with information provided in the middle, and satisfaction with provider's concern. And each one, you have a accompanied group, everyone in there is accompanied. Uh, and then an unaccompanied group. And you see divergent trends such that when accompanied in each of those outcomes, the sat an association between hearing and the satisfaction outcome drops out. Whereas in the unaccompanied group, uh, it moves in the opposite direction, that the point estimate uh, is larger. Although the confidence intervals are also wider just because you're looking at less people in some of those groups. Um, so, you know, I'll also just say an interesting thing about this is, uh, you know, it's not the purpose of this research, but I just find it incredibly fascinating. The only other variable in the uh, models that did this was English as a, a primary language other than English. The other variables that are associated with less satisfaction with care, race, ethnicity, lower education, uh, and lower income levels, none of them were modified on this same pattern. None of them were modified by accompaniment. It didn't seem to make a difference. So we think accompanying to healthcare visits does potentially modify the association of dissatisfaction with care and trouble hearing, uh, which is an important finding in and of itself. But for me, it's, ex it's sort of extra important that hearing itself via a modifier that sort of makes sense for communication is modifiable, it's changing, it's a risk factor we can do something about. Otherwise, some of the research we've been doing, it's possible that some unmeasured residual confounding is what's making all the difference here. And of course, that's still possible with these models, but I think we're getting closer to the fact that it is something we can do something about. There's limitations, this is cross-sectional, self-report data, um, and there's an association between hearing and accompaniment, but 
I would pose to you that, um, you know, there's some conservative bias there and that those with more severe hearing loss, the, those who probably have the most communication difficulties are the most likely to be accompanied, which end up having better satisfaction outcomes. The reason this is so important to me is because uh, the work that I'm doing with Dr. O at Baby Medical Center is translating this research into action. And so we are currently just starting uh, the last phase of a K-23 award where uh, we're actually get, uh, enacting our program called Engaging Healthcare to Address Communication Environments, the Enhanced Program. Um, I thought of that acronym, it took me hours and several beers, and it turns out you can just like put things into websites on the internet and they'll do that for you. I have no idea. Um, we train staff on how to communicate, best practice communication. We think about technology, but we actually spend most of our time focusing on communication patterns and how to maximize that technology. I'll just remind you from the beginning of this talk, it's not about just making things louder. It's about improving clarity, which has a lot to do with your patterns of communication. We use signs in the room. Yes, those are the color signs we use, but we use them because they're bright, because they're different. Um, we had to go to the aesthetics committee of the hospital three times to go before the aesthetic czar to get permission to do this and make these. We do use amplification for those with you know more uh, uh, severe hearing loss and we give handouts on how to use the devices. And so this program kind of looks like this. We screen for admission. It's part of common admission procedures. Uh, we screen for hearing loss. Those without hearing loss, we don't do any intervention. Those with mild hearing loss, we have communication signage. And those with moderate or greater hearing loss, we have signage and an amplifier. Um, right now, uh, we're collecting some baseline measures on satisfaction with care, satisfaction with communication, and delirium in the hospital before enacting sort of a parallel cluster design where we're uh, engaging in this program to see if it actually makes a difference on these important outcomes. And with that, about five minutes left, I will stop. Um, I'll take a second for questions, then I have another slide before we move on to the next. Well, Dr. Deal, that's a question for what you presented earlier, isn't it? <laughs> um, so Dr. Deal has presented work that uh, perhaps uh, hearing is related to uh, exclusion from uh, healthcare research. And I think that's absolutely a concern that we always have in secondary data. Um, I will say that you can spend some time digging in on these surveys. Uh, I'm not trying to promote the Medicare Current Beneficiary Survey, but I do really appreciate that they have a module on their website that talks about the efforts they go through to engage adults with sensory disabilities. Um, you don't see that on all websites, um, and you know this vastly differs by study. So uh, I think my answer to that question is yes. If uh, if we revisit what Dr. Deal showed this morning, hearing loss is associated with exclusion from uh, studies, and they may not be able to participate in those studies. Um, but I do think that varies drastically study to study based off the efforts and accommodation measures taken by those studies. It's a great question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so I need a parallel life as a bioregion of some researcher. So I was really interested to hear you allude to the effects of um, participants who don't have, or not participants, but um, care receivers who um, did not have English as a primary language. And I was hoping that you could expand on that. Um, and just generally, and maybe this is a question for the, the wider group, you know, there's so little research on speech perception and hearing healthcare in people not communicating in their native language. 
Uh, and it strikes me as just a huge hole in your field time knowledge. Um, I think that's a great question. So I have a couple of thoughts. Um, one, we actually have looked in some other studies that we were focusing on uh, hearing loss. We looked for interactions with English as a secondary language, a second language. Um, and we've not found anything uh, that was you know, significant, but I'll also just point out that uh, the numbers are really low, to be honest with you, in this survey in particular, uh, which we've used. Um, in this study, I point out that association where uh, those who had English, uh, a primary language other than English, they saw, we saw the same accompaniment changes. We saw that same modification because I think it parallels hearing and it's a communication issue, right? And having somebody there to sort of be your interpreter and be your uh, advocate makes a difference. I should, you know, I know Moisa Sklo is listening in and I should just say, it's table two fallacy, and I totally understand that. The, the model was not designed to look at uh, language issues. It was designed, we, we were thinking about hearing loss mainly, and those are the confounders that we added in. So it's possible that, you know, I'm making a huge error in even commenting on it. Um, but I think for the most part, many of the same confounders would be involved in healthcare access. And uh, I think that in, in general, I see this as a communication barrier, right, and satisfaction. Um, the other thing I was going to add is that in this study, uh, similar to the hearing question, English as a second language is a huge barrier to participation. And I think that not only do people not participate in the study at all, almost every time I've used this study, when we look for missingness, we see more missing values among those with uh, primary language other than English than any other variable. It's usually the top. So, you know, sometimes I take with a grain of salt what's being said uh, in there just because I'm not sure that we're really capturing what those participants actually want to convey um, you know, for, for what it's worth. So I, I do sort of put some caveats on that, that research interpretation in the secondary data as well. So, but uh, to your point, I totally agree with you 100%. I think there's an interaction between hearing and uh, and actual language, and I think we need more research digging in deep there. It's going to be definitely a primary research area, though, where you have to set the study up, similar to what Dr. Newman talked about. You know, people are being excluded at a high level, and we have to do research specifically to dig in on those groups, those vulnerable populations. You know, I should say for uh, the statisticians in the room, we also did uh, an interaction variable for modification, and it was significant. I just like the stratified approach better because it's easier to interpret and visualize. <laughs> I only did that for Josh. Uh, with that, uh, we are going to take a short break. I believe uh, we have 15 minutes. Uh, I think it, yeah, it's 942. Um, we will be hearing from our keynote, Dr. Riley Phillips. We will be moving from uh, the hall, the place where location we're currently in, to Page Hall, um, same floor um, on the other side. I actually don't know where we are. We're on this side of the building, I think, on the east side. East side. No, wherever we are, I can't see anything. There's no, there's no windows to orient myself. That's the west side. We're on, um, we're on the east side. Yeah, we're going somewhere. We're going to be moving. Uh, the, our keynote talk uh, by Dr. Phillips is titled Sensory Function and its Relationship with Cognition, Brain Imaging, and Dementia. Um, for those of you online, uh, we're just going to take a short 15 minute break. You don't have to go anywhere or do anything. Uh, we will regroup at 12 o'clock. Thank you so much. So I just uh, two follow quick announcements to follow on. Uh, uh, Nick, so first of all, thank you all again for coming here this morning. Um, Page Hall is for those who aren't from the building. You go out this way, make a left down the hallway, go all the way to the very end of the hallway, and make another left. Um, but again, we'll have a 15 minute break before that. Second announcement is for everyone online, about 50 people online. Thank you again for joining us online. Love to have you here in person. Want to put a final plug after Dr. Phillips' talk from 1 to 3 p.m. We'll be back in here where we actually have, I think it's Kissling's Wraps, is that right? Yes. So, and crab balls. And there's also alcohol too. So, for those of you who are online, who are interested in coming back and might be on campus right now and from the comfort of your own office, come back and join us for lunch at least from 1 to 3 p.m. Meet someone new. Uh, and the third thing I want to say is a big word of thanks to uh, Shannon Smitherman, Minnie Dimachowski, Jamie Trumbo for organizing this whole event from beginning to end. So thank you.
Yeah, yeah, that's, that's that's white boy in the middle. I don't know if she can. Oh, yeah, it was nice. Yeah, I just don't know. It's for a campaign. I got me. I was like, it was good. The lottery. Welcome to our keynote address for our Cochlear Center Research Day. So my name is Jennifer Deal. I'm core faculty and associate director for academic training at the Cochlear Center. And we're really delighted to have you joining us for this talk today. Um, we are uh, very happy to host Dr. Natalie Phillips. Dr. Phillips is a professor in the Department of Psychology at Concordia University and holds the Concordia University Research Chair, Tier 1, in Sensory Cognitive Health in Aging and Dementia. She's a licensed clinical neuropsychologist and teaches in the area of human and clinical neuropsychology. Dr. Phillips studies the neuropsychology of healthy aging and Alzheimer's disease. She examines the relationship between our senses and our cognitive abilities and language processing in older adults, including those who are bilingual. Dr. Phillips is one of the principal developers of the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, or the MOGA test, a cognitive screening instrument used around the world for the assessment of mild cognitive impairment. She's also the Associate Scientific Director of the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging, which is Canada's National Research Consortium on Dementia, and is the lead academic neuropsychologist for that group's COMPASS and D study, and a founding leader of the CCNA team 17. And I think that we first had the chance to meet now, it's been many years ago, um, in relation to putting hearing into the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. Um, and I know we've had a chance to talk about hearing and this relationship with cognition for many years since. So um, welcome, Dr. Phillips. We're delighted that you're here as a friend and colleague of the center. So thank you. First of all, thank you so much for having invited me. Um, it's my first time leaving the country in two and a half years. And I, you know, this was the group that would lure me um, onto an airplane. So um, I'm just thrilled because I've been following your work for so many years. So um, this is like bringing coals to Newcastle. Um, you know, what, what could I tell you about um, hearing and dementia? But um, I'll try to take more of a, a neuropsychological brain, um, brain basis uh, focus. And hopefully that'll be of interest to you. So, um, and I think I've hidden all the slides that involve your own work so that I'm not <laughs> presenting your own work to you um, because that would be much better. So, um, nope. um, no relevant disclosures. Um, I have funding from the, what we call the Tri Council Agencies in, in Canada um, as co developer of MOCA. It's, it's free, so that's zero dollars. Um, so um, we've known for many, many, many years, if not centuries, um, that our senses are important for our cognition. Uh, I like this quote from Immanuel Kant, uh, the German philosopher, all our knowledge begins with the senses, proceeds then to the understanding and ends with reason. And there's nothing higher than reason. So this interaction between our senses and higher order cognition um, has been recognized for, um, for centuries. But despite that, uh, research uh, tends to be siloed. Um, so is clinical practice and so is healthcare in terms of how it treats sensation, perception and cognition. But nobody told older adults this, um, aging comes in a package. And so we, um, of course, see older adults presenting to us clinically um, with a number of um, health, uh, health issues and comorbidities. So um, I like this uh, slide just to recognize that um, for, again, decades, we've recognized that there are important um, uh, changes in visual acuity across the age span in hearing acuity, and of course, changes in cognitive function 
um, across the lifespan, including perceptual speed, reasoning, and memory. So this is well known. But it was really um, the work from the uh, Berlin group um, that uh, told us that much of what we interpret as age-related changes in cognitive function are in fact mediated by changes in uh, visual and hearing acuity. So I, I, we've already seen uh, this slide about um, the prevalence of, of hearing loss. Um, so I will not mention uh, this specifically, um, but I'll just show you how um, much the prevalence uh, data from Canada mirrors what we've already heard uh, this morning. So these are data uh, generated by uh, Paul Nick, um, who's uh, known to many of you in the audience. Um, these are analysis of the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging data. And um, here we have the um, prevalence of hearing loss uh, in terms of count on the left axis and proportion on the right axis. The data for women are in red, data for uh, men are in blue. And we see, much as we heard this morning, that at about age of 70, at, there's at least um, mild hearing loss. Uh, prevalent in about 40% of the population. And uh, similar data um, are uh, available for vision, and we see virtually the same uh, prevalence counts. These are some data by my colleague, uh, Don Guthrie. And um, this is uh, looking at the prevalence of uh, rated um, uh, sensory uh, deficits in hearing and vision and cognitive impairment in um, older adults receiving home care in the province of Ontario and those receiving long-term care. And um, what you can see is that um, individuals who have no impairment in those domains are in the minimum, they're, they're in the minority. And what's much more common are at least single impairments with cognition being prevalent, hearing um, a little less so vision. And then we start to see the, the strong uh, prevalence of dual impairments, if not triple impairments between hearing, vision, and cognition. Okay, so um, here's a pop quiz. Um, I'm going to mostly be talking about dementia today, which of course means um, clinical impairment and cognitive function. But one of the take home points is that for the majority of older adults, they maintain their cognitive function across their lifespan. So I don't want you to walk away thinking, um, uh, thinking that all, all older adults have impairment in cognitive function. I always point to some glowing examples from Canadian culture um, about uh, two Canadians who um, are uh, you know, terrific examples of uh, robust intellectual contributions well into late adulthood. Anybody want to take a guess for me here? Leonard Cohen. Thank Leonard you. Cohen. Leonard Cohen and... Oh, Very good. So um, are you Canadian, the person answered? Uh, he answered one. <laughs> one made stale. Okay. Very good. Um, so, uh, so having said that, um, for the majority of the talk, I will be talking about dementia. And I just want to touch on what are the core uh, clinical criteria for dementia. So dementia is an umbrella term. It's not a disease in and of itself. It's caused by different diseases. Dementia is a clinical syndrome that refers to changes in either cognition or behavioral impairment in two or more areas of functioning. So it, uh, this is quite commonly in the area of memory, but it could also involve uh, visual spatial abilities, language changes, uh, changes in personality and behavior. It has to be a decline from previous levels of functioning. And they have to be uh, significant enough to interfere with activities of daily living. And that's what distinguishes um, it from uh, mild cognitive impairment, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia, but there are other um, causes as well, including Lewy body, um, uh, uh, Lewy body changes, vascular dementia, and mis mixed dementias. Okay, so we're gonna do a really quick neuroanatomy um, course. <laughs> so this is a, um, a medial view of the, of the brain in cartoon. So we're looking at um, core structures in the limbic system here. 
And the earliest changes um, associated particularly with Alzheimer's disease are in the hippocampus and the surrounding cortex, which is the anterior cortex. And these area, these structures are crucial for learning and memory. So, which is consistent with early memory deficits and Alzheimer's disease. Um, Alzheimer's disease has a characteristic pathology um, made up of abnormal proteins, a beta amyloid and tau proteins. There are also neurofibrillary tangles and um, the resulting uh, brain damage uh, produces cortical atrophy. And so you can see in this cartoon, if you contrast um, a healthy older brain, um, you can see the marked atrophy um, in the um, brain uh, participant who has Alzheimer's disease, particularly in these medial temporal areas. The, the development of this neuropathology follows um, a, pre uh, a predictable path. Um, these are referred to as the BRAC staging of neurofibrillary changes. And so in the very earliest stages, in the uh, preclinical stages of Alzheimer's disease, you see uh, neurofibrillary changes uh, in the uh, entorhinal cortex. In subsequent stages, uh, we see now um, more deposition involvement of the hippocampus and other medial structures. And then at the point where someone has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in more advanced stages, really widespread pathology throughout the brain. And um, this cartoon is um, adapted from uh, Clifford Jack's model. And this is a hypothetical model as to the onset of the biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. And um, what this uh, tells us, if we consider individuals who are cognitively normal, those who have mild cognitive impairment and those who have clinically diagnosed dementia, what you can see is that the um, amyloid, um, uh, amyloid deposition takes place decades before clinical symptoms appear. And then we start to see um, changes in the brain that are associated with the tau, um, uh, tau proteins. Uh, then one begins to see the onset of the structural changes um, an atrophy within the brain. And then only after this do you see the onset of uh, memory dysfunction and um, clinical changes. So I just want you to keep this thought in your mind that there's a continuum of pathological um, neuropathology and Alzheimer's disease. And that some of the groups that we're talking about, there will be individuals who are at some point in this continuum. So um, this, again, is a cartoon that's illustrating the um, association uh, with um, changes in cognitive function with increasing age. Age is the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So what this cartoon is showing us is that um, uh, here are the mild changes in cognitive function that we see. Uh, the animation is taken on a life of its own here. Um, the mild changes in cognitive function in healthy aging, um, the more precipitous changes uh, associated with Alzheimer's disease, mild cognitive impairment that really is um, possessed. And so mild cognitive impairment is a clinical uh, description that represents this gray zone of cognitive performance between uh, individuals uh, with normal cognition uh, and those who um, are on a pathway to developing Alzheimer's disease. So MCI are older adults who have complaints about their cognitive function and indeed they test um, below normal limits on psychometric tests so without a standard deviation below uh, normal limits but they have intact activities of daily living so they have mild cognitive changes but they're not deemed to be functionally impaired. Now, these individuals um, have a higher risk of going on to develop Alzheimer's disease, particularly if they present with amnestic um, or memory-related uh, cognitive difficulties. But not all of them will. And increasingly, uh, the literature since around 
2014 has recognized a, another clinical descriptor referred to as subjective cognitive decline. Now, these are older adults who have subjective concerns about their cognition. They feel that their cognition is poorer than it was. They think it's worse than their peers, and they're worried about it. But if you test them on uh, a neuropsychological battery of four or five hours, they test totally normally. In fact, all of our SCDs have normal cognition. But the question is, are these individuals, are they the worry well, or are they sensitive to what are the earliest changes in their cognitive uh, performance? Um, and that for some of them, um, they are on a trajectory to um, later developing MCI and then Alzheimer's disease. Now the challenge is these are really overlapping continua that are, are difficult to tease apart, and that's one of our goals. But the SCD and the MCI populations are really interesting because these are important target groups for interventions, um, such as um, the ACHIEF trial, for example. So um, risk factors for dementia, um, many of them are uh, non-modifiable. Age is the biggest one, family history. There are other genetic risks like APOE, um, uh, E4 allele, which is a cholesterol transport um, gene, um, sex, women have a higher incidence uh, than men, past head trauma and Down syndrome. Treatments are um, uh, not uh, underwhelming. Um, so acetylcholine esterase inhibitors um, at this point, behavioral management. There have been no new disease modifying treatments in the past 20 years, um, except for June 2021 when a uh, aducanumab was introduced and approved by the FDA, and there are just huge question marks around this. So um, all that to say is um, attention has turned to what are the modifiable risk factors for dementia or hypothetically modifiable risk factors for dementia. And of course, we saw this um, slide earlier today. Um, it, the Lancet Commission, headed by Jill Livingston and colleagues, in 2017 and then updated in 2020, said that 40% of dementia is attributable to the combination of 12 modifiable, modifiable risk factors. Now, of course, these are population uh, estimates. Um, and what we see are um, the risk factors, less education, uh, traumatic brain injury, a host of cardiovascular factors like hypertension and diabetes, smoking, physical inactivity, um, social factors, including depression, social isolation. Um, air pollution was newly added in 2020. But um, to top of the list, as we heard earlier, was um, this analysis that hearing losses um, uh, could account for up to 8% of uh, in reduction of dementia cases if it were to be eliminated from the population. So there's lots of assumptions here. Um, but of course, everyone with our <laughs> interest in, in hearing loss and sensory health um, were extremely interested to um, hear this um, publication. Um, I think, I, okay, so this is a slide I forgot to hide. So here is your own work. Um, but um, uh, at, the, at the time of the Livingston uh, study, it was based on three high quality studies that were available uh, in the literature at the time. And this um, analysis um, synthesis by Livingston and colleague, colleagues produced that uh, 1.94 risk ratio that um, Dr. Deal mentioned earlier. And that in combination with the high prevalence of hearing loss in the population, um, yields this 8% population attributable fraction. Um, and there's similar um, uh, meta-analyses that support these kinds of conclusions. So again, we've heard a little bit, but maybe I'll expand a bit here on some possible causal pathways between hearing, cognition, and aging. Um, uh, I'll walk you through them. Um, so first uh, is this idea of a common cause. Again, Dr. Deal walked us through these earlier today. Um, and that's the notion that there's really a central aging factor um, that drives both changes in cognition and changes in hearing. And this, um, there's no causal relationship between the two, but the two go down in lockstep. 
Um, some of these biological causes could be vascular in nature, um, could be due to inflammation, there could be sex and gender linked factors, there could be shared genetics, and um, we're interested in APOE. Um, in terms of whether there's Alzheimer's pathology in the auditory pathway, um, there's no real evidence of um, plaques and tangles in the cochlea or the hair, um, <coughs> hair cells. Um, but if we look at um, uh, the central brainstem pathways and, and cortical pathways, um, there is some evidence of uh, AD pathology, but um, not to the same extent as you would see in uh, the visual modality. Um, another potential um, explanation is the information degradation hypothesis. And this says that in, in real time, an impairment in hearing um, impacts cognitive performance. And we see, um, we see evidence from neuroimaging uh, for this. So if one looks at the speech networks recruited um, when speech is acoustically clear and ear easy to hear, you see lateral, um, uh, lateral recruitment in the left hemisphere, um, superior and middle temporal gyri and uh, inferior frontal gyrus um, to support all levels of um, uh, speech analysis. But when speech is acoustically degraded, um, we see recruitment from um, uh, more frontal parietal regions, premotor regions, and um, the uh, cingulate and the opercular network. So um, it could be that this uh, recruitment of additional brain, uh, brain regions um, depletes uh, the neural resources available for um, cognitive processing. So you know, what you devote to decoding an impoverished speech signal, there's less left over for encoding that information into long-term memory, for example. Um, so you could think that we, we hear with our ears, but we actually listen with our brain. Um, the next hypothesis is uh, related to this, and that's the sensory deprivation or cascade hypothesis. And that says that ongoing um, recruitment of these compensatory pathways causes in the timeline manner changes in cognition. And um, finally, there's a social mediated hypothesis. hypothesis. Again, we heard very much about the impact of um, hearing loss today already. And um, we know that hearing loss is associated with changes in social participation, increased depression, social isolation. Oops. And these themselves are risk factors for dementia. So it could be this socially mediated role. Now, all of these hypotheses are on the table. Um, and they're not mutually exclusive from uh, one another. And uh, so uh, we're, we're eagerly awaiting studies to inform this. So what I'm gonna tell you about is work um, that's largely supported by the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging or the CCNA. And this is a research consortium across Canada it was, um, it's been funded since uh, 2014. We're in our second phase. Um, so it is supported by what would be the, uh, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and, and Partners. And it's a research strategy designed to um, address prevention, treatment, and management of neurodegenerative diseases and to improve quality of life of Canadians living with, this, with these disorders. So, we're about 310 researchers and clinicians across a wide um, spectrum of uh, disciplines. There are three uh, broad themes of primary prevention, treatment, and secondary prevention and quality of life, which is where our team is. And there are embedded platforms, including a clinical observational study that I'm going to tell you about in a minute. Um, and um, so the teams are really encouraged to work uh, in a collaborative way. Um, and uh, so what I'll be telling you about in a minute are data that come from the Compass MD study. And, um, uh, and this work is uh, carried out with my colleagues. So we are CCNA Team 17, and we're like seven years into it, and we're still thinking we should have a better name than Team 17. <laughs> but um, anyway, we're the Century Cognitive uh, Team. And uh, many of these colleagues uh, will be well known to you, Kathy Cor Fuller, Walter Wittich, 
uh, Paul Nick, uh, and other fantastic colleagues. So we represent a broad spectrum of disciplines going from neuropsychology, audiology, otolaryngology, low vision rehab, uh, nursing, gerontology, and so on. And it's taken us a long time to learn how to talk to each other because we all think about things slightly differently. And that, um, but uh, these are a terrific group of um, people to work with. So one of the things that has been funded uh, in our work in the CCNA is analysis of data from the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging. So this is a population study of 50,000 Canadians. Uh, they were uh, for, between the ages of 45 and 85 at baseline, and they're followed every three years for 20 years. And this is work that's led by Paul Nick. Um, and within the CLSA measures, many, many, um, many, many variables, um, but most important for our purposes today, hearing is measured through pure tone audiometry, visual acuity, and cognition. And so uh, we've looked at the relationship between uh, sensory function and cognition. Um, in the CLSA, it's measured uh, via executive functions. There's measures of oral fluency, mental alternation, and the Stroop test. Um, I know that not everybody's from a neuropsychology background. So um, for the Stroop, you either name the color of the patch, you name the color of the ink, and of course the word uh, facilitates your naming, um, or you name the color of the ink, but it's, it's a word that interferes with your um, with your production. So after 30 years of being a neuropsychologist, I still hesitate to say red um, when I look at that. There is um, also a measure of auditory uh, verbal learning, which is the red. And from this, we computed principal component analysis, um, one for executive function and one for, for memory. And uh, in a nutshell, just looking at the baseline data, um, what we see, like, Many other studies um, is that poor sensory function is associated with lower cognitive performance. For vision, that is in the domain of executive function. For hearing, um, poor hearing is associated with poor performance on executive function and poor for performance on that verbal learning and memory test. And this is over and above the effects of age, education, sex, socioeconomic factors. Um, and health comorbidities, although having more health comorbidities exacerbates this pattern. And so what does this mean? Um, if we express the relationship between sensory change and cognition as if it was the same effect of cognitive aging, um, we can see that um, the changes are represented here. And so if we consider hypothetically Sally and Joan, um, they have the same age, they're the same sex, same education, same health comorbidities, but Joan has a, um, a moderate hearing loss. She'll perform as if she's five years older on the test of executive function um, compared to Sally and almost nine years older as if, if she also has a mild vision loss. So um, we just, just, just started to look at the three-year follow-up data. This um, it's just become available. So here we're interested in um, uh, the relationship between hearing loss, vision loss, and social isolation at baseline, and its relationship with change in all of those um, variables. And just take this as a um, preliminary data at this point. Um, but what we see is that. Um, uh, poor uh, hearing at baseline is associated with um, greater changes in executive function and memory uh, at three-year follow-up. Um, for baseline vision, um, this is associated with changes in social support, and these um, predict changes in, um, in, mem in uh, memory uh, performance at three-year follow-up. Um, soon we'll be able to consider the role of APOE, which is a risk, genetic risk factor for dementia. Um, and um, uh, just to situate the CLSA relative to other um, uh, population-based studies, um, we're able to look at hearing and vision simultaneously. There's quite a rich set of social data 
And um, there are some advantages in that the group um, sampled goes down to um, middle age. Okay, so now we're gonna change gears and I'm gonna tell you about the observational study that's embedded <laughs> in the CCNA. And this is the COMPASS ND study. And COMPASS ND study call, uh, stands for the Comprehensive Assessment of Neurodegeneration and Dementia. So this is an observational study that's embedded in CCNA. Um, and the goal is to look at who's at risk for dementia, how early can uh, it be detected in the at-risk groups, and what combination of tests are most effective, uh, most effective at detecting it. Um, so one thing about Compass ND is there's a spectrum of participants. Um, so <coughs> there are um, participants who have diagnosed Alzheimer's disease and mixed dementia. There are participants with Parkinson's disease, frontotemporal dementia, um, the largely va vascular presentations, and um, also the at-risk groups that I mentioned to you. So the participants with subjective cognitive decline and controls as well. So one way that the Compass ND study is, is distinguished from other um, large uh, studies of dementia is in the breadth of um, comorbidities that are present in Compass ND. So if you think of a study like ADNI, um, the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging um, Initiative, the, the cohorts are very narrowly defined in ADNI. Um, there's very strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. So you wind up with really clean categories of participants. Compass has taken a different approach, which is it allows for people with mixed pres clinical presentations, and there's a lot of comorbidities in the participants. And so they represent what is really the reality of clinical practice. Um, so at the moment, I'm gonna show you only cross-sectional data. There is a longitudinal component, but those data are coming in and um, you know everything got a bit crazy with the pandemic and was disrupted. So. Um, but those data are coming in. Um, data are collected across uh, Canada. For anyone who knows, that's about 4,200 kilometers to coordinate data collection. So it was, um, uh, that presented uh, lots of uh, fun challenges. What's core in Compass um, are the clinical data, about four hours of neuropsychology, MR imaging, genetics, blood saliva. Um, you can even get the microbiome because we're collecting fecal samples as well. Um, there's annual telephone uh, checks in it. Um, so we're just starting to have data released. So um, this uh, just gives you a snapshot of the groups represented. Um, this will ultimately um, be some of the, the sample sizes that we're looking at. And today I'm only going to tell you about data that are released from people who are cognitively intact, so the normal controls, the SCD participants, the MCI participants, and the AD participants. So early days with these data. Um, sensory performance is evaluated in Compass. What we use is a hearing screening protocol. So a presentation of two kilohertz tones at 25 and 40 dB, and it's whether you detect the tone at each of those um, DB levels. And this um, allows us to categorize participants um, in one of six categories going from normal hearing to moderate to severe hearing loss. It, we've validated this impoverished, if you will, or screening battery against full audiometric threshold from CLSA and it maps on um, very, very nicely. But these are the levels that we're dealing with. Um, oh, incidentally, participants who fail the pure tone screening are given a pocket talker to wear during the um, neuropsych assessments. And um, we also have an embedded speech and noise task using the Canadian digit triplet test, which gives us speech reception thresholds. Vision is assessed, visual acuity and contrast sensitivity. And we also measure olfaction, and I'll tell you about a, actually a fair bit about olfaction today. So we're using the BSIC, the brief smell identification test. It's an odor identification test. You have a um, you have twelve um, sheets. You scratch it, and you have to pick from one of four alternatives as to what the odorant matches. I don't know if anybody's ever seen the film Polyester, um, but it's like Odorama. Um, so. Um, 
The, uh, this allows us to characterize um, participants as to whether they have normal olfaction, have subclinical olfactory uh, difficulties, or are anosmic, um, and have frank um, impairment in odor identification. Okay, so that's how um, this is uh, measured. Um, and uh, so, um, again, early days with the data, we've got cognitively normal, SCD, MCI is our largest group in um, participants with Alzheimer's disease. They're matched on age and education, with the exception that the um, AD participants are somewhat older, and that's not much of a surprise. They're about four years older. At the moment, um, what we have is a sex imbalance, so bear this in mind. We have women um, overrepresented in the controls in the SCDs, equal um, men and women in the MCIs, and then men over represented in the AD um, uh, sample. And incidentally, we think that flies against conventional wisdom, um, but we think it's because COMPASS requires a person to have a study partner um, or a family member to participate with them in the study. So we think this is women caregivers bringing their husbands with Alzheimer's disease into the study. Um, so I'm not gonna say a whole lot about vision because um, vision is largely normal in our participants. Um, so this is um, a quadrant looking at um, normal reading acuity and normal contrast sensitivity. This would be impaired reading acuity and impaired contrast sensitivity. So you can see that people are mostly clustered in the, um, in the upper quadrant here. Um, although when we do use vision as a predictor in our data, it's always contrast sensitivity that um, carries the weight. So we're not going to hear too much more about um, vision, not because I don't think it's important, but at this point, it's, it's not well represented in our sample. So for, um, this is a snapshot of those um, hearing categories that I described earlier. Almost all of the slides that you're going to see are organized in the same way. So cognitively normal, SCD, MCI, AD. And um, the uh, no differences really in hearing levels between the cognitively normal and the SCD and the MCI, um, but a higher prevalence of hearing impairment in the participants with AD. Um, in some cases in the analyses, we enter um, the measures in, um, in with these six categories, and um, sometimes we dichotomize into hearing loss and. Um, and uh, normal hearing, so just bear that in mind. Okay, so one thing we um, we started to look at was the um, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment or the MOCA. Um, this is a, a test we designed and published in 2005. It's a screening tool. It's a 10 minute screening tool. It's not a global measure of cognitive function. It doesn't measure intelligence, um, but it is sensitive to MCI. Um, it measures eight cognitive domains that are relevant for MCI, um, and it's been translated into multiple languages, um, but it has its issues. Um, but, so th this is not ex exactly the issue that you might think it is, um, but there was, um, it did receive some attention when um, it was administered to to the former um, president of the United States. But um, now I think it's out there and people like can look it up and take the mocha. So anyhow, um, but here's the issue I'm really talking about, um, which is like all tests of cognitive function, it's administered in the verbal and the auditory domain. That's how we process information. So um, we look at the tests associated with vision, um, we look at the tests associated with audition, and crucially, um, the, the main way that we measure um, memory performance on the MOCA is by reading a list of five words. Um, so, um, important to bear in mind when we're using it as a screening measure. So what my doctoral student Faisal al Yawar did um, is he took the MOCA from Compass ND. It's used as part of the diagnostic criteria in Compass. Um, and he um, looked at men and women. Um, he split them as to whether they were normal hearing or um, had hearing loss. So you can think of it as a two by two design. Um, all this to say is they're, they're matched on the cardiovascular factors and depression. Um, so that doesn't differ. 
Um, and what uh, Faisal um, saw is that for, um, if we consider pure tone screening, women who had peripheral hearing loss um, were much more likely to fail the MOCA than they were to pass it. In fact, they almost never passed it. Um, and uh, no such um, difference observed in them. And that was true if we split the data for speech perception thresholds as well. And we see that kind of mirrored for other cognitive tests within the COMPASS um, battery. So we're, we're intrigued as to whether there's something going on with um, sex um, and the coupling between hearing and cognitive performance, but you know, early days for these data. Um, I wanted to um, just quickly present some data looking at um, the performance on that uh, tri triple digit um, uh, speech and noise test. And um, so here we're looking at speech reception thresholds for the four diagnostic groups. And I've just categorized them as to whether they have no hearing loss, mild hear hearing loss or mild, moderate to severe hearing loss. Um, not surprisingly, there's a main effect of uh, hearing loss. If you have high PTAs, you perform poorly on the speech and noise test. That's not surprising. Um, but what we do see is the patients or the participants with Alzheimer's disease, even when they have normal hearing, have poor speech and noise um, perception. So again, something important to bear in mind clinically. Um, we included measures of working memory in this analysis, and it does not explain performance on this. Um, in this analysis. Okay. So turning to some of the um, uh, brain imaging data, um, we had the chance to um, look at a hippo, a hippocampal volume. And what we see um, in the participants with um, subjective cognitive decline um, and more strongly in the right uh, hemisphere, is a relationship with um, hearing loss. So um, greater degrees of hearing loss associated with smaller hippocampal volumes um, in the SCD group. And remember that hearing loss actually doesn't differ between the controls and the MCIs and the, um, and the SCD groups. Um, We've also had a chance to look at resting state fMRI. Um, this is work my master's student, Nicole Grant, is doing. And um, what resting state fMRI lets you do is look at correlated activity, correlated um, uh, bold activity in the brain, which is the presumption here is um, blood flow is a surrogate for cortical activity. So brain regions that are more metabolically active or active um, require uh, greater blood flow, and this can be image. Okay, so um, this allows us to look at multiple different uh, networks, but the one that we're really going to focus on today is the default mode network um, and the auditory network. So why the default mode network and what is it? It's um, a network of um, brain regions that are correlated at rest. Um, and there is the medial prefrontal cortex and posterior aspects of the cortex. These are all on the medial aspect of the brain. Um, this is thought to be involved in spontaneous thought, mind wandering, autobiographical memory retrieval. So it's, it's the kind of network that you use when you're not doing anything. Um, it's probably the network we don't have anymore because we're always doing scrolling on our phones. Um, but so it's observable in the absence of a task. And why would we look at this? Because um, changes in the default mode network are demonstrable in uh, individuals with MCI. So typically the pattern is you get decreased connectivity in the posterior part of this network and increased connectivity in the anterior portion of the network. And in parallel, but not talking to each other is a literature that says age-related hearing loss is involved in exactly this kind of pattern of alteration. So we simply asked, well, many of these MCI participants are going to have hearing loss. Is that what's driving um, some of these changes? So um, Nicole just took the MCI participants in Compass, split them into whether they have um, no hearing loss um, or hearing loss. She's controlling for contrast sensitivity because we see altered connectivity with visual um, structures in the brain. So 
Um, the upshot here is that hearing loss within the MCI participants is associated with decreased connectivity between this default mode network and occipital and cerebellar regions in the brain. Um, these are all on the left side. And um, if she instead seeds, puts a seed to look at connectivity of either the left Heschel's gyrus, which is primary auditory cortex or right Heschel's gyrus, there's no altered connectivity in the left Heschel's gyrus with other brain regions, but in the right, uh, if you see right Heschel's gyrus, you get decreased um, uh, connectivity with the frontal pole, inferior frontal gyrus, and the middle frontal gyrus. So again, these kind of alterations with uh, anterior portions of the brain. So we're wondering if this is like some kind of functional reorganization due to um, hearing loss in these participants who already have MCI. Okay, so quickly, olfaction. Um, what, what you're going to see is that olfaction function declines significantly across the AD um, versus continuum. Now, the relationship between olfaction and dementia has been known for decades, since the late 1980s. Um, so what we're um, contributing here is, is being able to look at the the SCD or subjective cognitive decline participants. So this is work that's done by Zoe Papadavis, who's a, um, my research coordinator. So if we look at those BSIT scores, um, what you see is um, normal olfaction in the controls and SCDs, lower in the MCIs, lower still in the ADs. The SCDs and the normals don't differ from each other. Um, this is just representing um, normal olfaction um, versus impaired olfaction. And you can see that the MCI and AD participants had impaired olfaction. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, it's a lot. The, here's um, performance of the on the BSET, the olfactory uh, test, and uh, visual memory in this top panel, and right um, entorhinal cortex in the bottom panel. And what you see is that your olfactory performance predicts um, your visual memory performance um, in the SCDs and the MCIs, and it predicts enterrhinal um, cortical thickness in the SCDs and the um, MCIs as well. Now, the interesting thing is that SCDs and the controls have the same degree of olfactory performance. They do not differ from each other. But in the SCDs, the group that's at risk for developing dementia, you see this coupling between their olfactory performance and their uh, visual memory performance and um, entorhinal cortex. So um, in Compass, we had the chance to look at just the prevalence of multiple sensory impairments in our participant groups. And um, the thing to keep your eye on first is the green circle, which represents the percentage of participants who have no sensory impairment. And you can see that it just goes down. So um, here are the controls, here are the SCDs, here are the MCIs, here are the Alzheimer's participants. Only 4% of AD participants have no sensory impairment. 96% um, do. And you see this increasing overlap of sensory impairment across the diagnostic groups. So these are the people who are presenting clinically. Um, one, we've only, like, we ran these analyses on the weekend, so this is really um, kind of hot. <laughs> my R is still smoking a home at my, uh, <laughs> on my computer. Um, so here we're looking at the interaction between uh, uh, olfactory performance and uh, hearing loss stratified as to whether it's normal mild hearing loss or moderate to severe hearing loss across the three memory tests that we have in Compass. So there's verbal memory, visual memory, and associative face memory. And what you see is an interaction. So olfaction predicts memory performance on its own, but it's actually exacerbated um, in the participants who have um, moderate um, hearing loss as well. So uh, of course, we're keen to see um, more data here. Um, I'm just going to skip over with that for uh, in the interest of time, but essentially what we're, you know, if I can put some of this together for you and bring you back to um, these stages of pathological development, 
um, with the earliest stages with the entorhinal cortex and then the oncoming involvement of the hippocampus and then more widespread um, pathology in the brain. What we see in our groups is um, olfaction is really tracking the development of that neuropathology um, and hearing is playing a role in the SCD participants. Um, we need to get the sample sizes up, um, uh, up here. <laughs> I need her. I already filled it. Um, okay, so um, just to try to put a bit of a clinical um, spin on some of this work. Um, in 2020, what we had in Canada was an updated set of publications coming from the Canadian Consensus Conference on the Diagnosis and Treatment of um, dementia, and there's a number of publications that came out here, but one is addressing um, the reduction of um, reducing risk for late life uh, dementia recommendations to clinicians. So this would be geriatricians, um, uh, neurologists, uh, family practitioners, and then recommendations for whether we could consider um, sensory measures as a, a non-cognitive marker of uh, dementia. And um, the upshot here is that there's strong evidence to recommend uh, supporting uh, evidence, sorry, supporting the assessment of hearing and olfaction. Um, somewhat weaker evidence to support assessing vision, but of course, there are many, many important reasons to assess vision, not just strictly in the context of dementia risk reduction. And um, also uh, in this publication, recommendations to fo follow the WHO uh, 2019 guidelines for um, audiological examination and referral. So it's slowly getting, it's the sensory message is, is beginning to permeate clinical practice. And that's been no small thing within the CCNA for us, you know, team 17 is kind of waving the sensory flag, trying to get the other teams to pay attention to sensory health. So, uh, and the message is, is getting out, uh, thanks in large part to the work that you're doing. So, you know, we can think about this as sensory health as the canary in the coal mine. The last thing I want to tell you about is an initiative um, embedded in CCNA. And this is a long-term <coughs> project referred to as Can Thumbs Up. And I don't know if you know about dementia um, intervention trials in the rest of the world, but there was a very prominent trial called FINGER out of Finland. So these are multimodal interventions, behavioral interventions to reduce dementia risk. Um, so the Canadian uh, version of this is Can Thumbs Up. Um, and uh, so uh, the long-term plan is to have multi-arm, multi-intervention uh, trials, um, you know, looking at uh, physical activity, um, uh, diet uh, interventions, and so on. But what the baseline condition is, is a psychoeducational program um, that we refer to as Brain Health Pro. And these are modules that are available on uh, uh, health behaviors, ranging from uh, cognitive engagement, social and psychological health, vascular health, physical activity, nutrition, sleep, and vision and hearing. Um, we literally showed up at the meeting where this was getting planned and, and kind of um, crashed the party and said, you have to include um, hearing and vision in the planning for this. Um, so uh, embedded in here are um, what we refer to as the problem solving trio, which is uh, advice to older adults in terms of environment modification, adoption of technologies and changing attitudes and behaviors, reducing stigma. Um, and so um, this module is embedded in uh, this uh, Brain Health Pro program, which is now, it is just launched about two weeks ago. It's a one year long program of 181 10 minute chapters across the spectrum of risk reduction. And what happens is that an individual who's recruited into the study will be assessed as to what, what their primary risks are in terms of behavioral risk, could be cardiovascular health, um, could be nutrition, um, but it could be hearing and vision. And those are the three modules that you will receive psychoeducational materials for over the course of this year. 
And um, it's all based on e-learning principles. It's available uh, in English and French. And um, this is uh, really just launching now. We're, we're quite excited about it. So um, I just told you a heck of a lot of information. Um, let me summarize it for you. Um, so uh, what are the relationships between vision and hearing? We see clear relationships in the, that large scale population study, the CLSA. Um, uh, let me walk you through this slide though. So considering cognition, brain structure, brain function, and psychosocial data with respect to vision, hearing, and olfaction. So um, you can see right away that we haven't had any time to address the psychosocial factors and that's where we wanna go. Um, uh, next, um, at this point in the compass participants, we're not seeing major relationships between the senses, but what we do see is relationships between hearing and olfaction and altered um, brain structure um, and cognition and brain function. Um, so we think these, uh, there are subtle cognitive effects in cognitively healthy older adults, but you need a large population study to observe them. We see these demonstrable effects of hearing and olfaction in the at-risk groups. Um, the brain structure seems to be tracking the earliest stages of neuropathology, and the evidence from the brain function seems to be suggesting cortical reorganization. Um, we're intrigued by some of the evidence of multisensory um, interactions, um, and we're intrigued by the possibility of sex differences in the data which we think are in there. And what I wake up in the middle of the night going, why is it the right hemisphere? Why is the right hemisphere showing the most changes? Um, where are we um, now? We're anxiously awaiting um, getting the APOE status of our participants. That's a big question mark. Um, soon the blood um, biomarkers will be available so we could look at questions like um, inflammation and microvascular changes. We um, need those larger sample sizes to come in um, from future data releases and, um, of course, the longitudinal data. So take-home messages. Um, we see associations between um, sensory status and brain integrity. They, these associations tend to decrease across the AD spectrum, so they're not there in the normal controls. They're there in the risk groups. And then the neuropathology in AD kind of starts to wash out these effects. Um, the mechanisms are still unclear, and we are the next most excited people to hear about the results of the achieved study. So we look forward to the RCTs being released. Um, so, um, of course, uh, oh, sorry, I'll just skip over this. So, the, just to close, um, hearing loss and vision are highly prevalent but underidentified in the clinic. There's, of course, important implications for cognitive screening, cognitive assessment, cognitive performance, and cognitive clinical status. They're amenable to treatment. So even if they're not related to dementia, there's no harm in addressing um, hearing and vision health. Um, and of course, they have important implications for everyday functioning and quality of life, which we've already heard about today. Um, just two um, points. We have two postdoctoral positions. Um, one is to look at sex and gender sex and gender in an integrated fashion across all of the levels of the compass data. So that would be going from neuroimaging to cognition to aspects of communication between patients and caregivers, which um, we have we have those data. So um, <coughs> if you're keen to learn about brain imaging, please contact me. And um, even more relevant, um, we have um, a postdoc position to look at the 12 modifiable risk factors for dementia using the CLSA population study. Um, and um, so we really need people who have um, some epidemiology chops. <laughs> so again, if you're interested, um, uh, please contact me. And um, just uh, finally, thanks to um, what is a great group of people to work with and the trainees um, and funding uh, from the CLSA, from CCNA, and all of the people across these 30 data collection sites who have collected data on over a thousand participants. So thank you very much. I'm sorry it's a bit over time, but perfect. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Phillips, for that outstanding talk. I want to apply for the postdoc position. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. <laughs> Any questions from anyone in the room or from anyone at home? We're monitoring the chat, so please feel free to close there. Dr. Lynn in the room. Natalie, thank you for the wonderful talk. And it's, it's really exciting. Last time we spoke years ago was when Compass ND was just in progress and in planning. So it's nice to see it. You know, come to the end. With, well, not quite to the end, but you know, with the results. So this is more a philosophical question that comes up all the time, and it sort of hedges from Jennifer's talk this morning, which the idea I think you mentioned in one of the talks, in one of the parts, for Compass participants who fail the hearing screening, I guess basically fail both 40 dB tones, yeah. that they're routinely given a pocket talker at that point or amplification. So I've heard we, we've seen it actually both ways, right? Where some people say you want the cognitive testing, neuropsychological testing to be transferable, reflective of real life. Um, so there's a thought that you wouldn't want an amplification because that's not what they're doing in real life, right? As long as it's not being confounded purely by they couldn't understand the spoken word at all. And that's arguing why you probably should or maybe you should, I don't know. Um, versus other people saying, well, no, you actually don't want to get amplification because you want to reflect real life and you're getting an artificial um, boost per se, because let's say it frees up a working memory. What were the thoughts for Compass to routinely give that for um, uh, amplification in, the, in those cases? Right, so um, the argument is that we wanted the assessment of cognition to be as uncontaminated by sensory acuity as possible. So that what we, as best we could, we were measuring cognition and not failures to perceive the information at the time it was delivered. Um, I completely agree with you clinically um, that, um, you know, often people, I, I think it is uh, really important to deliver a cognitive test clinically under the conditions that resemble everyday life. You know, as a neuropsychologist, we, um, we give cognitive tests in a completely idealized setting where there's no distractions, the, the lighting's high. Hopefully, you know, I'm speaking in a way that's accessible to the participant. Uh, and then they go out into their everyday life and say, but I, you know, I'm so tired at the end of the day. Um, and, so it's a distinction between um, what you, um, an, an attempt to purely measure a domain, in this case, cognition, and um, uh, versus, yeah, uh, taking uh, behavioral evidence in the participants report about what their everyday experience is. So, um, yeah, we had to come down on one side of it. So it was an attempt to measure cognition as purely as we could. Thank you. And I think maybe in the interest of time, we'll take one final question that was posted online. And that comes from Dr. Moises Sloh, who's an epidemiologist here at Hopkins. Dr. Sloh says, great talk. There are some factors related to aging and cognition that are consistently neglected in many studies of cognition, such as hypothyroidism and certain medications that may affect cognitive test performance, such as sleeping pills and antidepressants. Do you have data on any of these? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, so there's a huge array of data that's collected in composition. Um, so we know about medications, we know about sleep, we know about sex hormones, we know about adverse early childhood experiences, uh, we know about alcohol consumption. So um, the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, and what we don't, what's about to be released are these biologicals. Um, the biological samples um, and um, these more alphanumeric data are available. So uh, we do have readouts on, on thyroid function and all of the things that one would standardly measure in a, um, in a geriatric assessment. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I should, if I could just say, um, the data will be op uh, open access. Um, there's a period of quarantine um, of which starts the uh, when all the final participants have been tested and data uploaded. There's a one year period of quarantine, and then the data will be open access to researchers. So um, we invite uh, collaboration. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, before we thank Dr. Phillips one last time, just one quick announcement. So for those of you who are joining us online, thank you. This concludes the online portion of our program. We're really delighted that you were able to join us today. For those of you who are here in person, please join us again in Finestone Hall. As Dr. Lynn mentioned, we'll have lunch and alcohol if you like, as well as some great posters. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, one additional note for trainees and staff is that Molly would like to make sure to get all of your photos when we go back over into Finestone Hall. So before you get lunch, if you could please check in with Molly and we can get some of those photos taken. So um, with that, thank you again so much, Dr. Phillips, for an amazing talk. We're really grateful. So please